Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Great to see folks joining us this afternoon on uh, November 29th at this meeting of council. Um, I note that all of our councillors are in attendance, therefore we have quorum. And with that, I would like to call this meeting to order. And uh, as we are starting a new tradition, we'll begin with a land acknowledgement. And today, uh, Councillor Greenfield will be reading our land acknowledgement. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional lands and treaty territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which includes the Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation, and the Chippewas of Saugeen, First Nation. We also recognize the Métis, whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. We extend our gratitude to all Anishinaabe, and Métis peoples and their descendants, past, present, and future, who continue to care for and inhabit these lands and tend to these waters. Thank you. And I ask you all to join us in a moment of reflection as we consider the business ahead of us. Thank you. Is there any uh, declaration of interest in uh, any of the items on the agenda today? Uh, seeing none, if one should arise, please uh, feel free to declare it at that time. And now we'll move into uh, five, number five on our agenda announcements. And uh, we'll ask uh, county, our councillors if there are any uh, announcements from their perspective. Councillor Greenfield. Thank you again, Your Worship. Um, yes, this is uh, uh, a brief uh, uh, email I'd like to, like to read to uh, the council and the public uh, on behalf of Councillor Kentner and myself and the uh, and, and the library board. Uh, uh, dear Kimberly Grafton, I am pleased to confirm your appointment to the Board of Directors of the Ontario Library Service for a period not extending three years effective the date of this letter. On behalf of the Government of Ontario, thank you for your willingness to serve our province and the work of the Ontario Library Service. I'm delighted that you have agreed to share your time, knowledge, and expertise in this important work that will make a difference for Ontarians. I hope you'll find this experience with the Ontario Library Service rewarding. Please accept my warmest personal wishes for much success in your tenure on the board. Uh, kindest uh, regards from uh, Minister Lisa McLeod. And uh, uh, again, we're very, very pleased to have Kim, uh, a member of our library board representing our municipality and many municipalities across Ontario. Ontario. Thank you. <clears throat> well done. Thank you very much. And congratulations, Kim. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to uh, announce and remind folks that the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay is, is presenting a Zoom event focused on sustainable, attainable, and affordable housing. And it uh, is designed to find out how it affects the whole community and where will we be in five years. The sustainability series is being implemented to ignite a regional sustainability vision. The housing event is occurring this Wednesday afternoon, December the 1st at 4.30. You can get further information on the Southern Georgian Bay uh, Institute website, or you can get in touch with uh, myself or Director Rob Boyd, as we will both be speakers on this panel. And it's quite an honor to have two representatives of Meaford out of the uh, four speakers. So I think that says a lot to uh, how Southern Georgia Bay feels about what's happening in Meaford. So Director Boyd will speak to planning processes, and then I will address some social finance tools. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing some of you at that Zoom event. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Congratulations to you and to uh, Director Rob Foyt. Um, we look forward to attending that, uh, that session as well. Very interesting topic. Anyone else from uh, Council? Announcement. Um, then I will begin um, uh, with uh, the sad announcement of a major fire that happened um, in our western boundary on the 10th concession over the weekend, and I'd like to express our condolences to the family 
uh, there was a death, a very sad story, and um, uh, we send our heartfelt condolences to the family. And a, a word of thank you to our frontline firefighters for their bravery and dedication in handling that situation. Last night marked the first night of the Festival of Lights, also known as Hanukkah. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish all of our Jewish friends a very happy Hanukkah this, uh, this year. Um, moving on to uh, Christmas celebrations, a reminder to all that uh, coming up on Saturday, December the 4th is the day we celebrate in the downtown with uh, lots of uh, activities happening throughout the day and um, activities such as, uh, as with, through the library, all leading up to the Kinsman Santa Claus Parade. Uh, just a reminder for folks to, uh, that will be in attending uh, attendance to bring a non-perishable food donation. The Connect Club of Mayford will be uh, co collecting those items during the parade for the food bank. Um, and I would encourage anyone wanting more information on this uh, to follow the Kinsman Club and, and or the Meaford Chamber of Commerce on Facebook. Um, if you happen to miss uh, Santa on the 4th because of the crowd that will be around, you can also visit him at the library on December the 11th from 11 to 1 p.m. And uh, uh, obviously photos will be uh, in order there. Also an encouragement to shop local, get your Christmas shopping early and support local makers and businesses. Farmers Market will be hosting Christmas markets on uh, again on December the 4th and the 18th from 11 to 4 p.m. at um, Meaford and St. Vincent Community Center. Um, but please note that COVID-19 uh, safety protocols will be in, in place and we encourage you to wear a mask and maintain the social distance as, uh, as you enjoy the uh, festivities there. With that, um, we will move on to public participation. Again, it's wonderful to see folks joining us today in person and to those who are joining, watching us on uh, YouTube or and through uh, Rogers later on this week, uh, welcome to all. We do have a, a presentation, a first presentation is uh, Katie Holovacki from the Sydenham Optimist Club. And uh, they're going to fill us in on what they've been doing with the community bursary funds. So welcome, Katie. Thank if you. you feel comfortable, you may remove your mask. Is it on? Is it on? Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> so I can just be a bit taller. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I just wanted to address uh, mayor and council and community members to thank the municipality of Meaford uh, on behalf of the Sydenham and District Optimist Club. I'm also here with my colleague, Mike Thede, who's a 21 year member of our club. I'm currently honored to be the president of our club. Um, and this bursary has been amazing for us over quite a few years. We've always used it to support our Canada Day fireworks and celebration in uh, Leith or Annan. It's moved around a couple times back and forth. Um, that particular celebration has been meaningful to myself. It's how I ended up in the Optimist Club. So I can speak for, I think, lots of people in that uh, children in the area have been able to benefit from that get together for many, many years. It was eight or nine years ago that I went with my kids and was uh, so impressed that I ended up joining the club as a result. So, so normally um, without a pandemic, we use those funds toward the, the fireworks and all of the free stuff that we offer. We do kids games and things like that. So um, for years and years, it's been a great way to use the community bursary fund. This year was different and last year, uh, so we received the fund and then were unable to proceed in 2020 with our fireworks. But at the same time, we had started a project to put in an inclusive playground at the High Boot Conservation Area. Um, what we focused on with that was inclusivity. So we, we picked items for the playground and this particular uh, presentation that I have is actually one that I used for the accessibility committee. So it, it focuses on those aspects of the playground. So I'll just run through quickly the slides and then I'll talk just briefly after that about uh, the bursary and the role that that played in it. So I'm not sure who's controlling the slides, but I'm gonna go. ask if we can flip. Yeah, so basically we, we've got an inclusive swing. You do see these at most playgrounds. 
Um, but that was that was definitely something that had to be included. Uh, the next one, the spinning chair. So that's something I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, but we we did consult with community members and organizations that serve uh, kids with special needs, and this came out as something that uh, is really really useful for anyone. Well, autism is one of the the main uh, beneficiary of kids with autism uh, that benefit from this, but also any kids that just want to spin around. And uh, my own kids, I think some of the adults in our club have taken a spin on this chair as well. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, although it makes you pretty dizzy. Uh, and then the next one is the Braille panel. So that's also uh, obviously an inclusive feature that's just up on top. And I'll show you a picture at the end of the whole playground. And then after that is that hammock, which is a nice place for kids to isolate if need be, get away from all the action um, after the hammock is the, oh yes, the uh, communication boards. So when initially when I reached out to the municipality and it was in regards to the bursary, I connected with Margaret who put me on to the Families for Autism organization here. So I had talked to a more provincial body about autism, but didn't realize that we had a group right here in Meaford. So that was amazing. And they donated, donated the two communication boards. One is already installed. The other one is gonna go on the beach further down from the playground at Haibu. Um, and then after this, I think is the, I, oh yeah, so these are already in. So there's the music panel um, and then the sign language board. And then this is pretty neat. This is something, again, I haven't seen anywhere else, but the rocking nest. So these last three items actually came about as a result of a grant that we found out last minute that we were able to get instead of we were originally told that uh, it had to be repurposed for COVID activities and then they reached out and said no you got it after all so those last three items we got uh, the next couple of slides we can flip through they were things that we're still considering um, that and maybe we would do that and the wheelchair swing there just wasn't room at the site and then the final one is this is what the playground looks like now only that's of course a <laughs> virtual <laughs> picture of it I wish I could have brought uh, the, the I wasn't able to send the slides it was too much too big of a file but what I really would have liked to show you is our club working together, shoveling in all of and raking in the wood chips, um, putting the sign up. So there's a big sign that acknowledges sponsors. Uh, Municipality of Meaford is acknowledged on there. And also um, our members work together. And it, it really just gave our club uh, something really inspiring to look at when, and as one of our club members said, it's tangible. So what, quite often our club donates money to various causes, but we actually now have a place that we can go and visit something tangible that we put in, we can see the kids enjoying it. So when Mayford reached out um, early this year regarding the bursary, it was at a time when I had just been turned down or our club had just been turned down for uh, the grant that eventually did come through, um, but we were feeling a little bit deflated. Uh, we had done really well with fundraising, but we were down to our last 10,000. And then this email came in through through Mike, who's always dealt with the Canada Day stuff and corresponded with Meaford, um, offering that we could repurpose that Canada Day money. So it was sitting there. We kept thinking maybe we'll do Canada Day in 2020 and just make it or 2021 and make it even bigger but things weren't looking so good for that. So that was um, just a really good timing for us that we received that email and were able to support the idea of putting that $1,500 bursary towards the playground um, because at that time we were feeling a little bit like, okay, what are we gonna do now? So the club has often had fundraisers like community dinners, paint parties, none of that could happen um, during COVID. So we, we did have to do other things. We got creative and had bottle drives and uh, other things we sold plants at the side of the road and on Facebook, that sort of thing. But um, you know, even our yard sale last year couldn't happen. So the timing was perfect. Um, we supported the idea of putting it towards the playground. We were very grateful that the municipality agreed to that. And then we also had requested the bursary for this year in hopes of doing Canada Day. And I'm sure Mike could attest to the fact that dates and deadlines kept happening and we eventually had to cancel our fireworks order. Uh, we had then hoped to do a grand opening at the playground again, COVID got in the way. So um, the, the, all of that money ended up going towards the playground itself and was well used, as you can see. So anybody that hasn't yet been to High Boo Conservation Area, this is, uh, it's alive and well and doing it. There's lots of kids using it, maybe not so much in the winter, but um, 
yeah, I've got could have shared lots of pictures of kids using it and adults because our club members all tried it out, but uh, we're very grateful. But thank you very much for um, for that bursary, the community bursary. I assure you it was put to good use and hopefully we'll be back to our Canada Day activities next year. Thank you very much, Thanks. Katie, um, and, and congratulations. What a wonderful way to repurpose and to be innovative and creative for our, uh, with regard to things that we couldn't do over the, the course of COVID, but uh, were able to uh, compensate in other ways. I was so happy to attend the grand opening. You did have a grand opening of our, it was a sponsorship, uh, thank you, uh, that afternoon at, uh, uh, at, at Highbrook Park. And um, I remarked then, and it was obvious here today that, uh, you know, you had a lot of sponsors, you had a lot of help, and you had a lot of folks working together, all kids at heart, I would uh, hazard a guess, Mike, <laughs> and uh, for the work that, uh, that the Optimus Club has put in. And it was no wonder from the enthusiasm and the, uh, the excitement that, uh, that you put forward that day um, and again today for uh, the work that this club has been doing is certainly infectious and very much appreciated. So thank you for that. Thank you for all that you've done and we'll continue on our, our very happy partnership over the years. Council, any uh, comments, questions? Thanks again. Okay, Simona, we is on deck for our next presentation from the community gardens, uh, community gardens. And Simona is virtual. So welcome, Simona. Good afternoon, Mayor Compass and uh, Mifred uh, Council and everyone who is uh, presented. My name is Simona Freberkova, and today I speak on behalf of the Mifred Community Gardens, a nonprofit organization that engages volunteers, gardeners to grow an abundance of quality and locally grown food for all of the Mifred's community members. We currently have three community gardens located in the town of Mifred and at the old Georgian Bay Community School location, Victoria Village and the Church of the Nazarene in a form of snack garden. Since 2011, these sites yield fresh organic produce for the community every year and the harvested and delivered produce is about a thousand kilograms every year. Historically, Meaford Community Gardens were founded in the partnership uh, with Transition Meaford, GBCS and current Meaford Food Bank and Outreach. That happened in 2011, so we just celebrated 10 year anniversary. During the existence of the community gardens, uh, there were a number of activities with the school groups, uh, enhanced the students' uh, curriculum in 2019 and 2022. We took, um, I, I personally met uh, with Liz Buckton and we reviewed uh, 13 possible locations. Uh, where we could move uh, after the school is going to be sold. So it came to our attention that uh, we are aware that the Blue Water District School Board is going to sell the old school property um, where one of the major gardens is located. We are aware that uh, this will put the community garden in jeopardy and we will have to move in the near future um, with uh, current dwellings. We have two sheds uh, located, we have hoop house and the gardens. Um, a couple of um, benefits that I would like to uh, share with you. I'm not sure if everybody knows that um, the one of the biggest uh, benefit of having community gardens in the municipality is to reduce poverty, um, to improve Food, security, uh, food insecurity in the municipality is obviously food production, but also access to healthy food. It provides a lot of social networks and social um, benefits to local residents. For example, it helps a lot during the COVID with the isolation and uh, it provides um, fresh produce to whom that cannot buy fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. But it also provides a land to garden. 
that was quite an uh, interesting comment when people say it's actually providing a land to garden. Uh, when you don't have a land, I guess you don't, uh, you feel um, you don't have actually space to grow food. Uh, but also uh, it allows to grow different plant species to attract pollinators and adding carbon sequestrations to our land. So there are many different benefits that community gardens offers. So due to uh, the fact that uh, the school uh, has moved and there is no indication that there will be a new community gardens at the new school, um, we would like to uh, ask for a support from the municipality uh, to either determine a suitable site for the future location of the affected community garden, either to stay at the current site or uh, finding a new location. I have, uh, I would like to move forward, for, I prepared a motion um, if that would be, um, possibility to move forward. Um, I'm not sure if I should read the motion right now, or can I ask for whether this is appropriate to... Uh, I would suggest that it be delivered to the clerk's office. Um, Matt, did you want to comment before we... Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I think uh, it's absolutely fine for the presenter to read the motion that they would like to have passed, but then it would have to be a notice of motion from a member of council that then we could bring forward on the next agenda if a member of council thought it appropriate. Thank you for that. So go ahead, Simona, if you wish. Whereas uh, Meaford Community Gardens has occupied a plot of land at the old GBCS location since 2011, Whereas the Blue Water District uh, School Board will be selling the GBCS property. Whereas the Meaford Community Gardens wishes to continue to operate community gardens within the town of Meaford. Whereas the Meaford Community Gardens would ideally like to continue to operate the Meaford Community Gardens at the current site of the old GBCS site. Therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to work in partnership with the Meaford Community Gardens in determining a suitable location for the future site of Meaford Community Garden. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Appreciate your comments and the growth work that you have done and your group has done for our community. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I Go ahead, please. If I may add, uh, one of the things that I'd like to add um, while we are looking at the possible locations, um, uh, currently I am reviewing opportunity to uh, get a funding for Meaford Community Gardens as Meaford Community Gardens is a, a recipient of the bursary program as well. Um, I would like to comment that uh, right now there is an available grant from Hydro One. It's called Energizing Life Community Fund. Uh, the deadline is January 31st. It's up to $25,000 uh, for community to uh, energize um, and uh, physically, uh, emotionally support communities. So I would like to just make a note that uh, we could, I could partner, we could partner with the municipality because we are no longer um, under Meaford Food Bank. We are currently under um, United Way, uh, Bruce Gray. And uh, I'm proposing to partner with the Meaford municipality to apply for this grant. Um, to be able to secure a future location and be able to uh, prepare the land for a smooth transition. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your efforts on that behalf. Okay, Deputy Mayor, you want to comment? 
Thank you very much, Your Worship. And I just wanted to thank you, Simona, for all the work that you were doing in our community, not just with community gardens, but with Transition Meaford in particular, with initiating the Styrofoam program. But I think one of the aspects that I've been aware of of the community gardens is the very special relationship that you develop with the kids, the kids that come out and help you. And just what a wonderful, wonderful experience it is for those kids to uh, get their hands dirty and to learn how to garden and to work by your side. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Hey. Thank you, Simona. We appreciate your time this afternoon and your, and your good work. Moving on to our third presentation, Kelly Haslam from, with the Tom Thompson Trail Group. Welcome, Kelly. Again, if you feel uh, comfortable, you can remove your mask. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Compass and council members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to represent the Tom Thompson Trail Group for you today. I'm joined by my colleague, Ruth Ann English. Uh, Ruth Ann is a founding member of the Tom Thompson Trail Group, and she's been volunteering her time and expertise to the group for about 20 years. She's currently the chair of our group. I, on the other hand, am a relatively new member to the Tom Thompson Trail Group. Uh, my role right now is as trail captain for the Meaford sections of the Tom Thompson Trail. Um, today, we're here to share a little bit with you about the trail itself, about our volunteer group, what we do, um, and the value that the trail brings to the town of Meaford. We also have a request for support from the town that I will get to at the end of our short presentation. So this is a slide that depicts the map of the trail. Uh, the trail was conceived about 20 years ago by a group of citizens, including Ruth Ann, who thought that it would be valuable to have a multi-use non-motorized trail that connected Owen Sound to Meaford. They planned and built what is now just over a 40 kilometer trail that includes both road sections and off-road sections. The off-road sections are most, mostly follow unopened road allowances. The trail is a three season trail. Um, so that means that it's maintained by the Tom Thompson Trail Volunteer Group in the spring, summer and the fall. In the winter, the majority of the off-road sections of the trail um, are used by and maintained by the Snowmobile Club. There is a small section that due to the nature of its topography is not accessible by snowmobiles. Um, and that section is an area that is increasingly popular with winter hikers and with snowshoers. In 2019, the original group uh, of volunteers declared that their vision for creating a multi-use non-motorized three season trail that connected Owen Sound to Meaford was complete. Some new volunteers, myself included, have agreed to join into the effort and to shepherd the trail into the next phase. In the immediate short term, we would like to repair and replace some aging infrastructure such as drainage culverts and boardwalks. And there are also several areas of the trail that need the gravel to be replenished. We also have had some expenses in the last year um, around replacing one of the kiosks, like in the picture that you see there, um, a car had uh, hit it and destroyed it and we had to rebuild it. Um, we also have one area that is uh, a very steep pitch um, and posed some safety issues. So we had to do some regrading there. So that was some additional expenses that are a little bit out of the ordinary that we had this past year. This organizational chart shows the structure of our group. As I mentioned, Ruth Ann is the chairperson at the top of the organizational chart. Uh, my role is Trail Captain East, responsible for the Meaford sections of the trail over on the left of the slide. Um, one of the points of clarification um, that I had for you was who at the town of Meaford that I should be engaging with on any issues that come up. Um, maybe we can circle back to that at some point. 
Our 16 volunteers are loosely grouped into leaders and laborers. Um, the leadership group does most of the communications, fundraising, logistics, and coordination, um, while the labor team um, does a regular trail maintenance. They're committed to being out on the trail regularly, checking to see what the conditions are of the trail, um, noting any issues, and then are responsible for actually completing the maintenance as required. If it's a project that is too technically challenging or heavy for us to do as a volunteer group, we would be responsible then for coordinating a contractor to support us in that work. The trail is a popular local attraction um, that's used by many locals and tourists alike. We're actually seeing um, a big uptick in the number of people that are using it. We're seeing some um, stresses at some of our parking areas and things like that. So that's something that we're monitoring and, and looking at. The trail is important and valuable to Meaford because of the role that it plays in active transportation and in active living. Those policy directives and objectives at both the local and county levels are supported by the Tom Thompson Trail. We'd also like to highlight that the volunteer group provides some value by providing trail services and maintenance for the trail. The trail does and will continue to drive economic development and tourism in Meaford, um, strengthen the connections within Meaford's urban and rural areas. Um, and the trail also supports Meaford's growing need for active transportation and recreation. Just a little bit about some of the challenges that we face. Um, we mentioned um, some of the aging infrastructure um, that, the, that we're experiencing on the trail. We have some significant maintenance and repair costs in the past year that I mentioned, and we expect also to make some upgrades to the trail. Another significant issue for us has been increasing insurance costs. And then a minor challenge that we've been facing is some of the unopened road allowances on the trail are being developed. Um, so we expect that to continue as well. Our ask of council is continuation of the much appreciated funding that you've provided in the past. We expect our financial needs for the Meaford sections of the trail to be approximately $6,000 in 2022. And we've itemized on the slide where we expect to spend those funds. In exchange, our commitment as a volunteer group is to continue to monitor the trail and complete any repairs and upgrades that are required to ensure that the trail is a safe place for Meaford citizens, as well as tourists to enjoy. So I thank you very much for your time today, the opportunity to present to you and for your continued support of the Tom Thompson Trail. Thank you very much, Kelly. That's great. And we all appreciate the work that goes into maintaining these trails and uh, providing a recreational outlet for all of us and uh, residents and tourists alike. So we appreciate it very much. Um, thank you for your presentation. Comments from uh, council, questions? Hey, thank, thank you. you very much. And moving on to uh, item B of this um, public participation, we have a deputation on an agenda item and welcome Scott Gooch to the uh, microphone. Welcome, Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council, sorry, I can't hear much. Um, yeah, so I'm just representing the Chamber of Commerce quickly. I've submitted the letter I hope everybody's had a chance to see it on our concerns about the expansion of the paid parking pilot that was implemented at Memorial Park last year. Uh, I think most people agree from what I've read that it's uh, worked rather well, achieved more or less objectives other than perhaps the achieving the funding or not the funding, but the revenue generation expected. The concern with expanding beyond Memorial Park uh, into the Harbor and uh, Johnson Park, our concern is that well, people will behave much as they have behaved elsewhere. 
Uh, if you put paid parking in those locations, people will, of course, some people will pay, just what they do. Most people will try not to pay. And so they will prefer to park offsite, which as we've done Memorial Park will require some kind of parking enforcement buffer, whether it be residential, whatever that buffer needs to be, to encourage people that, okay, you gotta walk too far and they're gonna pay their parking. Um, but especially when we get to the harbor, which is about 300 meters of the BIA, um, now we're running into conflict. People, if there's a buffer, they might therefore park within the BIA, which would be a good thing. People could argue economically, because while they park there, they might visit some shops. But of course, the parking for the duration, we have two hour parking, and rightly so, we have two hour parking within the BIA uh, to help the shops. And so people can't park for three or four hours, so they will look for where they can park for three or four hours, which will be at Nelson Street parking or in the Market Square. And now we're chasing around, well, how are we gonna enforce so people don't park all day there and depriving the people who regularly visit the shops from parking there. It's this whole spy versus spy dynamic. You imply your fee, people try to avoid the fee, then we have to put some parking enforcement, spending resources and money to do that and so on and so forth. And I, I, I don't see, or we don't see the chamber how it's actually gonna benefit in the long run. I don't think we're gonna realize the economic income that we're hoping to get. All the while, as we've seen in Memorial Park, and as we can expect from the research on parking behavior, people have now just opted to park at other beaches. It's silly, they don't pay $10 and they spend $50 to get there, but that's what people do. Uh, Queens Bush, for example, used to be just myself and my dog. And suddenly now with lots of people changing faces every week, people going there, but there are no toilets, not even the garbage cans. Well, say we have to do something with that because we've now encouraged them not to go at Johnson Park because they're too cheap to pay. Fine, uh, but now we're sending enforcement there and making more rules. So iteratively, we keep just expanding the effort, spending more resources, trying to get people to stay and pay for a little bit of parking. I just don't see the economic benefit. I think we're gonna see as Memorial Park, parking demand dropped in the face of paid parking. That's an anticipated outcome, we expect that. Um, and that's good for Memorial Park. We're just shifting the burden elsewhere. And every time we move it to yet another location, we're expending more town and municipal resources to deal with that. Um, and all the while we've now pushed them out of the BIA because once they get past Red Reaper Park, um, now we're pushing them not towards the center of town, we're pushing them further away. So that's the concern of the chamber is in fact, if we try to pursue a little bit of money income from paid parking, beyond Memorial Park, we're actually going to undermine any benefit that might be achieved. And the additional parking before by law enforcement resources that the municipality has hired on, they're now taking care of other business that needed to be taken care of. Those resources will be drawn away from there again, back towards parking enforcement. So the details are in the letter. I just simply don't see the business case. The, the numbers aren't there either on parking behavior, parking pattern, resident versus non-resident, or even the details into what, what next or so what. Those, those details have been included that I've been able to be provided with uh, what I would consider a proper business case to support it. So the Chamber of Commerce is concerned about this. We think it won't have a positive outcome. I don't think the municipality will realize the revenue they're hoping. And, um, and my personal belief, I haven't flown this by the board, is that uh, really truly you know examine other things for revenue like uh, short term short term rental tax, which the province now allows. Owen sounds imposing, doesn't influence behavior. Once they're in the municipality, the park they choose, they're not linking it to the tax you just paid, and, and we're back to more neutral environment. So thank you for your time. That's all I have to say. It is our concern. Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate your your comments and taking the time to share them with us today and your letter. Any comments, questions from council? No, seeing none. Okay, the, uh, ha we have no public questions that have been registered. So we will move on now to questions from council. Council inquiries. Councillor Kentner. Thank you, uh, your worship, and through you to uh, Mrs. Wiley. Um, we've all heard about uh, disruptions to the supply chain especially in the automotive industry. And I'm just wondering if you could give us a bit of an update on our contract with Enterprise and maybe specifically uh, 
how many vehicles have been delivered or that we've acquired or how many have been sold and if there's been any impact on our budget. Over to you, Jessica. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks so much for the question. It is definitely not a surprise that um, the automotive industry has had some challenges and therefore there have been some more timing implications to the actual acquiring of our new vehicles. We have 23 units that are included in the program itself and we have acquired 10 to date. Um, so there's 13 outstanding in various stages of completeness at this point. Uh, we have four of them are larger one-ton vehicles, which require a chassis, and those are now identified as being delivered in 2022. We have everything possible across that everything else will be delivered by the end of this year. Um, we have, we've heard that there's four that we should be achieving in the next couple of weeks. So like things are happening just a little bit slower and more unpredictable than we had originally expected. Um, impacts in general, I mean, the, the number one reason, and I think the news has done a good job at, at bringing awareness to it, has been the shortage of microchips. So the vehicles we've had ordered um, have been sitting waiting on microchips for quite some time. That has been one of the major implications to everyone in the automotive industry, I think. And unfortunately, our vehicles did fall into that category. We have... Um, a small benefit, I'm going to say, there's, I mean, we have some benefits, but a small benefit to that particular issue has been when we placed our order, uh, we were ordering a certain type of vehicle, and now we are going to be obtaining vehicles that are slightly um, more upgraded, I guess is a way to put it, at a reduced cost, which will actually benefit us when we go to resell the vehicles. So. There are very, very, very slight differences in what we had ordered versus what we are getting. And we're, we're talking things like running boards. <laughs> um, we're not looking at anything that is, you know, extremely fancy, but we will see definitely a resale benefit when we go to sell the vehicles again. And, and there's no negative cost implications to us at all. I think the big thing is um, we sold eight vehicles. We have two that are just leaving us in the next, probably this week to go to auction as well. We have seen sale prices almost double what we were expecting. So as it stands, we can safely say that we're looking at about $58,000 more in the sale of the vehicles that we have sold so far. And we still have 13 to sell. So I feel like we're in a positive place given the demand for used vehicles. Um, it just has been unfortunate that we haven't been able to get them all at the same time or sell them all at the same time just based on how everything's gone. But I am happy to say that it looks like we're, we'll have a positive outcome to the unfortunate timing. Mm. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, Your Worship, thank you. Um, I had a question for Mr. Armstrong. Um, Rob, I know it's on the docket to uh, present a report related to uh, short-term rentals, but I'm just wondering as we're seeing more of those now appearing in our community, and that means of course that those homes are taken out of the potential longer-term accommodation inventory, whether or not we should be um, putting um, more of an emphasis perhaps on moving that report forward, or I just wondered how staff felt about that at this point. To your worship, um, we haven't uh, obviously circled back. I think it was to continue monitoring the purpose of licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have provisions in place for short-term rentals and based on size, based on zoning bylaw, and that will be revisited um, as we go through the zoning and official plan process, that's probably our next step as we, we look at that and then evaluate. Um, I think once we uh, get up to full staffing uh, very shortly on the planning side, we'll have some additional resources to also look at some history on, on that matter in adjacent communities and uh, have that advantage as we go forward as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Anything else? No. 
All right. Moving right along then, we'll move to 8.1, um, which is the uh, uh, items that we have seen before. We can pass as a block through a consent agenda. And the first one to be considered by law 2021-86 is uh, uh, to adopt a council remuneration policy. And that be taken as read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. B is bylaw 2021-87 is uh, to be resolved that uh, this bylaw is to authorize a consent agreement pertaining to 206663 on Highway 26. C is DEV 2021-42 is uh, the recommendation that the council support the request for a one-year draft plan approval extension to the County of Gray for the Meaford Haven um, development. Uh, D is uh, COM 2021-25 as a um, paid parking pilot extension. And the recommendation reads that Council of Meaford approve the permanent continuation of the paid parking program at Memorial Park. And number two, direct staff to expand the program to include David Johnson Park and to Meaford Harbor. And number three, to direct staff to bring forward an updated parking bylaw to enact the expanded parking program to include provisions to allow for parking fee exemptions for certain events at Meaford Harbor. And C, to expand the residential parking permit system to the associated neighborhoods. And uh, also then, of course, to direct staff to include revenue and costs associated with this expanded program in the 2022 tax supported operating budget. Are there any of those four that anyone would like to pull? Councillor Kentner? So item D, please. D. And Deputy Mayor? Uh, D as well. D as well. And Council Bartley? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to pull A. Okay. okay. Anything further? All right. Then may I have a mover and a seconder, please, to include B? Uh, and C in a consent agenda. Councillor Bell and Councillor Bartley. All those in favor? And I just carried. Okay, moving first then to A is the bylaw 2021-86, a council remuneration policy. And Councillor Bartley, you asked to pull that, will you uh, move it? I so move. Thank you. And a seconder, please, Councillor Vickers. All right, did you wish to comment on it? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the counter enumeration policy, I agree with a as a basis point. <clears throat> now in talking to the uh, people that were on the committee, they did through their investigation find out that the council remuneration was slightly above the 50 percentile and their intentions were not to give a raise to council to start with. So what got my attention was we were handed a piece of paper last week. Um, it looked a lot like the one we got today, but it had a starting point of 25,000. So that confused me because that's really not what's in our agenda. So anyways, working with it, I would like to bring a motion forward that we start with 2021 remuneration for council and that's net Renumeration minus our life insurance as their starting point. For you, Madam Mayor, uh, that is $24,500, uh, give or take $5. Um, what happened when Council approved the policy in 2019, uh, the base salary at that stage, I'm just trying to pull it up, but I think it was $23,600. Since then, uh, you should have had 1% in 2020. Uh, unfortunately, that was missed, and so you're being made up that for in 2021. So you got 1% in 2020 and 1% in 2021, and that comes to $24,495.24 for an annual salary. So $24,500 is the 2021 salary for council. Without the insurance? Without the insurance. I appreciate that, Matt. I I did everything I could with T4s and paychecks and I couldn't figure it out at all without the insurance. So no, absolutely. I thank you. So I will pull my mo the motion forward and accept A as it stands. Accept A as it stands, okay. 
Um, anybody else want to comment on this? Then I will call the question. All in favor of uh, uh, count at number A bylaw 2021-86 as it stands. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no, better get it out. Okay, moving on to COM 2021-25, the paid parking pilot. And uh, Councillor Kentner, you have, uh, will, will you move it? Yes, yes. Okay, and Deputy Mayor, will you second it? Certainly. Thank you. All right, over to you then, Councillor Kentner, you want to comment? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. So uh, just a few thoughts. Uh, I think that the chamber has identified that there really isn't a business case to extend paid parking beyond Memorial Park. And I think that the harbor is an attraction that brings people to our downtown core, and that we could be driving business away if a non-resident has to pay uh, $10 to drop a line in the harbor. Uh, and it's crystal clear to me that the intent uh, is for paid parking to spread to all of our parks as we go. And I think just the fact that the city of Owen Sound was gung-ho for paid parking until they realized the impact on the Harrison Park Inn should give us pause to think about that. And uh, I, I just feel very strongly that it takes a long time to build a brand like Meaford has, and it only takes one $50 parking ticket to greatly diminish it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kentner. Um, I'm going to ask a, a staff for clarification on this, first of all. When you're referring to parking, extension of parking uh, to the uh, harbor area, uh, is that also including the, what is it, the north side or the, uh, the other side of, um, because Mr. Mr. Gooch had referenced to being very, very close to the BIA uh, property or uh, containment area? So no, the, the intent wouldn't be that we'd include the space on Bayfield Street, it would be in the, the harbour. Harbour. What's defined as the harbour as you enter through, through the gates there. Um, I, I would also just like to point out that um, I haven't heard any member of council mention the idea of moving uh, to paid parking at all of our parks. And, and as I made clear last time around, staff really have no opinion on this. Like we, this wasn't our sort of plan in the first place. And uh, while we're happy to implement council's decision, it would always be council's decision. So there's certainly no plan from our point of view to move this to all parks at any stage. Thank you for that, uh, Matt. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Gray County uh, tourism staff have completed an Environics uh, Know Your Visitors report, which is quite enlightening. And uh, the stats from that uh, report state that for 2021, um, tourism visits are down uh, from 2020 by roughly 12%. Um, I have some numbers for me for that indicate um, our visitor stats are, are down probably even more than that and, and they track those through uh, cell phone information so it just uh, is worrisome for me if visits were down this year and we have no way of knowing how the pandemic is going to impact tourism in the years to come. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's gonna be interesting to follow. So um, from that perspective, I'm concerned about adding uh, a cost when we're trying to attract folks to Meaford. And my other concern is I'm wondering if we should be doing this ahead of receiving the uh, Tatham report regarding uh, upgrades to our harbor. And, and I would suspect that there may be changes to parking um, and how it's laid out to the harbor at that time and, and whether we should uh, receive that report before we make a decision on uh, paid parking. So I'll allow you to comment on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I don't believe that there is any uh, problem with reviewing with dealing with this before you've seen any report about designs at the harbour because what you're talking about is whether to charge for parking at the harbour whatever it looks like um, I don't imagine that it will change so dramatically that you either could or couldn't charge because of the changes that were being made uh, I think that's an aesthetic thing this is a, a practical thing of you know on the basis of do you want to charge or not 
Matt, if I may, the, one of the other issues with, with the harbor and charging for the parking there is uh, the fact that uh, um, it is the trailhead um, for the Bruce Trail going forward. And many, many folks come in and, and spend the day um, uh, cycling that route. And of course, uh, uh, that harbor is, is well used. And the new uh, washrooms that are, that are going and uh, upgraded um, in that area, fish cleaning station and so on. I think it offers a lot to tourists uh, coming into the area um, and spending the time there. Um, so I think that uh, for me, the, the issue with this is, um, this is uh, a uh, pay for use um, situation. And um, to me, there's, uh, there's three options uh, because of the services in uh, uh, parks and, and recreation areas like the Harbor, um, the, the request for upgraded services are there given the COVID situation that we've just come through. Uh, so either it's uh, pay for use for those um, uh, services and for the amenities that we're able to provide to our tourist, uh, tourist uh, public and uh, whether or not um, that then translates into a tax um, increase for our residents to absorb um, the cost of those uh, services for uh, that are specific to um, uh, tourists as well as the residents, of course. Um, the other option, the third option, of course, then is to revisit the level of service that we are providing in those park services because uh, they have to be maintained and they have to be maintained to an acceptable um, standard uh, one way or the other. So they have, that means they have to be paid for. So with that comment, uh, just open it up, Councillor Bell and then Councillor Greenfield. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I think Madam Mayor, um, you probably can sense maybe a little uh, differences of opinion on this subject around the uh, horseshoe this afternoon. Um, I would like to suggest that uh, Madam Mayor, when you call a question uh, on this, that you split it uh, with uh, question number one, the approval of uh, continuing at Memorial Park is a single question. And then uh, question number two to be about the expansion. And uh, if this council was to turn down the expansion, then I take it items three and four would be redundant. Um, there may be a new policy required to confirm, but um, I, I would like to see items one and items two um, it made separate uh, voting. And um, I would also ask at this time before uh, you call the vote that it is a recorded vote on the uh, issue of uh, paid parking and its potential expansion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you do that. Um, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, to Councillor Bell's suggestion, I think that we would need to have one and four as one part because regardless we will need to insert something into the budget because right now as we're planning we haven't done anything because the pilot has ended um but then two and three could absolutely be done separately the other way that you could deal with that would be to uh, have somebody propose an amending motion uh, to delete uh, items two and three from that if they if they wanted to just restrict it to memorial park that's cleaner from a long-term record keeping point of view, um, which obviously everybody knows I like, uh, but it could be done either way. Okay. Uh, Councillor Greenfield and then Councillor Bartling. Thanks, uh, uh, Your Worship. Um, okay, um, we've, uh, we've, we've heard uh, quite a bit of dis discussion. Um, uh, to, to me, the uh, the paid parking at uh, at Memorial Park uh, the, this year um, it, it was a pilot program, and uh, there's no doubt about it. The uh, uh, the funds recovered from it were not overwhelming, but uh, we have to start someplace and uh, see how it unfolds. Uh, I. Uh, somewhat associate uh, parking fees with uh, the bag tag fees. Uh, the bag tags are to help pay down the cost of waste management and to help move our municipality uh, towards uh, former Premier Wynn's magic 70% diversion. Now, uh, I think 
the bag tags have helped to do both, maybe not as quickly as we had hoped, but uh, I, I think they are working. Paid parking fees, uh, maintain the municipal parks. Um, if we don't generate uh, as much revenue as possible, uh, we know where that, uh, that money is gonna have to come from, uh, out of taxes or else, the uh, the park facilities are going to deteriorate. They're, they are not going to be kept uh, up as well as uh, as what uh, we or uh, our citizens or our visitors would like to see. So uh, this is, uh, I think, however we decide, it's, it's going to be a decision that's not going to satisfy everyone. But uh, it's, it's, it's council's responsibility to make these difficult decisions. And uh, I don't have a problem with uh, expanding the paid parking to uh, David Johnson and, uh, and the Harbor area. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I cannot and will not argue the fact that paid parking may or may not reduce tourism. It may or may not. It didn't reduce it in Solo Beach this year or last year. But I will tell you that littered parks and dirty washrooms would be the worst deterrent for tourism that you could face. So in this, what we're voting on now, you have to decide. You have to remember, we're not making the decision now if you're going to cut services and not clean the washrooms in the parks, which this thing may pay for. You have to make that decision. And if you're not going to cut service, this will cost on the tax base in next month when we deliberate. Just FYI, I have no issues with going ahead with uh, the program here. That's my opinion. Thank you. Councilor Bartley, Councilor Vickers. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I would like to speak in favor of the motion of, of paid parking. Uh, a lot of the same uh, reasons have been given by yourself and, uh, and the other councillors. Uh, speaking for uh, this uh, um, bylaw, uh, I, I, I agree with you completely. Like I just cannot keep putting the burden on the, uh, on the taxpayers of Meaford. When, uh, when the taxpayers of Meaford do use the park, they should, be, uh, they should be welcome to the park. But to have people coming from outside of our area uh, and not paying anything and expecting it to be free uh, all the time, I just don't think it's possible anymore. Uh, we just, uh, Mr. Greenfield and myself, we just had a conservation meeting. Uh, the Conservation Authority has increased their revenue by, I think, close to or over $300,000 in paid parking this year. Uh, this will enable the Conservation Authority, I know this, we aren't talking about them, but to spend an extra $100,000 on capital projects that wouldn't, that wouldn't be able to be uh, afforded if we didn't have the paid parking in those, uh, in those parks. And again, if that is, was the wish of the Conservation Authority, then that money would have to come from the municipality through their levy. So uh, I guess I'm of the opinion that I, I don't think uh, we should just keep asking the municipality, the, the people of this municipality to, uh, to keep paying the, the fee. I'm not willing to have it go back to the way it was, uh, you know, with, uh, I don't want to call them dirty washrooms, but washrooms that weren't maybe up to the standards that we had hoped for and would like to see, because I don't think they were ever completely bad. And I, I, I think we're being a little hard on the, uh, on the upkeep before, but, but I think it's important that we do uh, have a certain level of uh, cleanliness and, and upkeep. I, I thought it was very positive uh, when staff talked about having the, uh, um, I guess their bylaw, no, bylaw enforcement, uh, people riding around on their bikes and, and, and helping, almost acting like a tour guide. It actually kind of brought a, a, a bit of calmness in, uh, to the parks that the year before in, in uh, the year 2020, I know wasn't there. Uh, from the stories I've heard of, uh, of people littering and, and camping on the beach, and you know, trying to actually uh, launch jet skis, you know, back in their car up all over the uh, uh, onto the beach and trying to get them launched there, like that. That wasn't any way to be either. Uh, I don't think we want to be with Sega Beach style, where there's like the wild, wild west. I think we, uh, the people of Meaford and and in our community, uh, can appreciate a certain level of calmness. And with that calmness and and orderly, need it becomes a price. 
And uh, this is one way we can help uh, defer the price and the cost away from the people of, uh, of the municipality of Meaford. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Vickers and Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. I know this came forward um, at our last meeting, but I'm wondering, Mr. Smith, if I can ask again about the exemptions and whether you've had a chance to think at all about how they might work, because I am concerned about the businesses that operate at the harbour and the impact that paid parking could have on them. And we do have the fishing charter and we have the kayak uh, rental. And I'm also concerned about you know, the gray areas there because there's so many events that happen at the harbor and how that would be managed. Just for an example, the scarecrow workshops, the uh, um, the leader of those lives in Thornberry and is she gonna be able to get an exemption for herself and other uh, participants that come from out of town or just how complicated is it going to be to manage uh, the long list of, of exemptions that uh, would need to be in place? Uh, three, Madam Mayor. Uh... Um, I will say that no, I haven't thought about it at all since the last meeting, because as I said last time around, until council makes a decision to, to help us sort of tell us what to do, uh, I'm, I don't want to spend the time to try and work that out. What I will say is that uh, the deputy mayor has just listed many, many different things that could have exemptions and the more exemptions that the council wants. Um, because this would be completely a council decision as to what those exemptions will be. We'd bring forward some recommendations as part of a bylaw. Um, the more exemptions that you have, yeah, absolutely, the more difficult this gets. Um, and if you have lots of exemptions, then you may as well not have paid parking because it's impossible for us to enforce. We need a lot of administrative time to, to make that work in terms of who gets passes and different types of passes and when does it count and when does it not count and, and so on and so forth. So it would be difficult if you want to include exemptions, um, but we would do what council wanted. Councillor Kentner. So I, I would just thank you, Your Worship. I'd certainly like to say that nobody around the horseshoe is wrong, and I have the utmost respect for the opinions that uh, my fellow councillors have expressed because they're right about a lot of these things. Um, I'm just asking people to take a big picture look at things because if you if you think of what draws people to Meaford and to the harbour, we've got two things that I'm not sure you can get anywhere else along Southern Georgian Bay, and one of them is fishing charters and sightseeing charters. And the other is the ability to uh, rent a kayak and just paddle around the harbor where you're safe. And if you have to pay for parking $10 to take advantage of these businesses that are, I assume, paying the business tax in Meaford and are, are uh, operating uh, ventures that are attracting people to the community, um, I think it's counterproductive. That's, that's my only point. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, Councillor Kentner, there is no business tax. The businesses that are in the harbour do not pay a, a tax. Is there any uh, anything further from Council? So we do have a request to split um, the uh, this recommendation going forward. Um, there has also been a suggestion that perhaps an amendment would be to um, to create another motion uh, out of this. Um, Mr. Smith, would your, your guidance, please, which, which would uh, be the better way to go? Uh, three, Madam Mayor, my preference uh, for record keeping uh, will be to have an amendment to this rather than to take it in parts. And the amendment would simply need to be to remove clauses two and three from the motion on the floor. But okay, if nobody wants to do that, we can. No, I would be very happy to move that. Thank you. Okay. All right, is there a seconder for that motion? I would second that, Your Worship. Councillor, or Deputy Mayor. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I'll call the question on removing. Oh, may I uh, ask a question? Sorry. I think Councillor Bell also uh, would like a recorded vote for, for the amendment as well as the yes, motion. Yes, I've got that down, thank you. But uh, I'll have uh, Councillor Bartley speak first. I'm sorry, so are we taking, extending the paid parking off the table? Uh, so no. if the amendment, the amendment that's on the table is to delete clauses two and three, that would in effect remove the direction to expand the program. Uh, 
you would then have the opportunity to vote on the remaining motion, which would be if the amendment passed to keep it going at Memorial Park. Uh, as I mentioned last time around, if you reject this entirely, if, if all votes fail, uh, then that would just mean the paid parking disappears in altogether because it was a pilot project that's now finished. So you should vote yes on the amendment if you believe it should only stay at Memorial Park. You should vote no on the amendment if you believe it should be expanded. Okay. Is that clear with everyone? All right, so we're voting now on the amendment to remove item two and item three from the recommendation. And uh, it has been, a uh, re recorded vote has been called. So we'll begin with uh, Councillor Bell was uh, recorded. Uh, Councillor Bell. I'm voting yes to remove two and three. Uh, Councillor Bartley. No. Councillor Greenfield. No. Uh, Councillor Kentner. Yes. Uh, Councillor Vickers? No. Deputy Mayor Keaveney? Yes. Uh, Mayor Clumpus? No. Uh, the motion fails four to three. So now uh, we are back to calling the question on the recommendation as presented, including clauses one, two, three, and four. And again, a recorded vote is, uh, is, has been asked for. Okay, uh, so on, on the motion that is listed in the agenda, uh, which would uh, continue paid parking at Memorial Park and expand it to include David Johnson Park and Meaford Harbour, items three and four are sort of administrative ones. Uh, Councillor Bell. Yes. Councillor Bartley. I need clarification before we vote. Is that possible? Please. So if we go to put in some special circumstances, can we do that now or can we do that later? We would do that later. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, so Councillor Bell has voted yes. Councillor Bartley. What is the question? Do you wish to pass the motion? Yes. Councillor Greenfield. Yes. Councillor Kentner. No. Councillor Vickers. Yes. Deputy Mayor Keaveney. No. Mayor Clumpus. Yes. Uh, the motion passes five to two. Okay, thank you. Moving on to 8.2 um, items for consideration. The first one A is DEV 2021 43 and the corresponding bylaw 2021 88. Uh, the recommendation reads be it resolved that bylaw 2020 88 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 60 2009 of the municipality of Meaford pertaining to 245350. 22 side road be taken as read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. May I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table? Councillor Bartley, Councillor Greenfield. Okay, uh, comments, everyone? I popped out here. <laughs> Anyone have a question, comment? Councillor Bell, thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, and to the clerk, I think when this came uh, at the committee of the whole, this is about um, an at-home machine shop that they're going to be doing. Is that correct in my mind? Yes. yes. I'm told yes. Um, in that case, Madam Mayor, uh, at that time, I declared a conflict. And so this afternoon, I should declare a conflict and I'll fill out the paperwork later. All right. If you <laughs> feel that's uh, necessary. Thank you for that. I think you had a reason for it. I mean, we need, do need a reason for the, uh, the rationale for your declaring an interest. Uh, the reason, Madam Mayor, is um, I have a machine shop. And so uh, that would be some maybe loss of revenue. So. All right. We uh, Any further comments, questions on this item going forward? No. I'll call the question then. All in favor of the zoning amendment being passed, and that is carried. The next one, bylaw 2021 89, is uh, be it resolved that this bylaw uh, appoints a treasurer, and uh, this be taken as read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. And the treasurer would be Valerie Manning. Um, a mover and a seconder, please, Councillor Vickers. And Councillor Kentner, thank you. 
comments or questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, we'll call the question. I'm sorry, I did, did I, do you have a comment? Sorry, Rob, I didn't um, see that. I, I was just gonna mention that Val is, has joined us today for anybody that uh, has not met her, not to send her out, but she is in, in the back there. So I just wanted to mention that to council. Well, thank you for that. And I should have recognized Val. We, this is the first time we've seen you at council, uh, Val, so welcome. Uh, my apologies for, for not recognizing that up front. <laughs> so with that, we will call the question all in favor of appointing uh, Val as our treasurer. And that is carried. Six to one. Can I have a mover and a seconder please to move into committee of the whole? Councilor Bartley and Deputy Mayor. All in favor? Carried. And 2.15. Okay, moving on to the first item, uh, CAO 2021-20 is a Memorial Park Master Plan. The mover in a second, you're pleased to put that on the table. Councilor Greenfield, Councilor Bartley. Uh, this has been a long-awaited <laughs> final and uh, formal uh, acceptance or, or uh, not of this uh, uh, Memorial Park Master Plan. If, uh, any comments for Council? Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, yes, it has been a long time, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the members of our PAC group and of our AMP group, the Advocates of Memorial Park, for all of their efforts over the last many, many months and years as everyone has worked together to, uh, to formulate the uh, content of this plan. I think we have a really good report before us today that is really specific and pertinent to Memorial Park. And I wanna sincerely thank everyone involved. And I'm especially pleased with uh, a comment within the report that reads, park and municipal staff should meet regularly with interest groups to, abstain, to obtain ongoing feedback about the park. And I just think that's so important and uh, considering all the input that's gone into this plan to know that that will be ongoing uh, makes me very happy. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Councilor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question for uh, either Mr. Smith or Mr. Armstrong. And uh, if it's, uh, Premature, let me know, but I was just wondering if you could give us an idea of uh, what projects might we see coming forward uh, on the 2022 budget? Uh, has anything been uh, uh, earmarked for, uh, uh, for next year? Uh, you're testing my memory, Councillor Greenfield. Um, I believe we have two projects scheduled for Memorial Park uh, that we talked to the Parks Advisory Committee about a couple of months ago. Uh, one is uh, upgrades to the road, uh, roadway, the entrance in particular, uh, and the other is some, some upgrades to the office at Memorial Park. Uh, the other projects uh, will be delayed, won't take place until 2023 or later because we need to get this approved and then we need to start to establish exactly what order we need to do things in. Okay, thank you for that. If I may, your okay. worship, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give thanks to uh, our former treasurer for uh, getting this master plan in gear. And uh, uh, he did do a lot of work to get uh, get the wheels rolling here. And uh, I just like to give him uh, a thank you for uh, uh, for getting a, uh, a a very important plan uh, underway. Thank you. you said, Councillor Greenfield. Thank you for that, Councillor Kentner. Uh, thank you for your worship. I'm just not sure who to ask this of. I, per, perhaps actually, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Bartley or or Councillor Greenfield. Um, on page 76, 3.1, the, the change in priority uh, from urgent to, uh, you know, putting it off for a couple of years, this has to do with engaging a, an environmental engineer. And I'm just wondering with all the uh, weather events uh, the, that created an urgent situation and it looks like they're not going away anytime soon, 
why this uh, was put off somewhere down the road. Councilor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'm not uh, really the expert on the thing to comment on this. I don't know if Brady could come on, comment on or not. I believe that when the emergency came forward was before we did any work on the break wall. There's been extensive work on the break wall. It's not finished, but I think that would take it from emergency to a high. Uh, yes, do your worship. Um, much of this report was written before we had to do emergency work at Memorial Park to, to deal with erosion. Uh, that bit wasn't changed after Pat's feedback. So, so I believe that that's why, because we have actually done some of the work already. Okay. Thank you for that. Can I just ask, does that mean that there will not be any action in the foreseeable future to reduce the number of uh, of um, parking or, or camping spots on the on the shoreline? Uh, for you, Madam Mayor, um, I can't I can't say that one way or the other because uh, once this is approved, then we'll start to plan how we should implement that. And of course, it'll be a council decision when it comes, but there'll be capital projects involved, I'm sure, uh, to, to make amendments down there. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And again, Ross, I'm not really at liberty to say this. Um, until we approve the master plan, you can't plan anything. Once the master plan has been approved, then you can dig into it. Now I have had meetings with the parks director very recently, and that's the first thing on our mind. So we need to get this approved before we can go forward. It may not happen in 23, but, and it may, we're, we're, it, it has to be worked on. And you can't work on it until you have a rules. I think one of the things that that sort of will help council as we go down this path is that once we've adopted this, then we will be doing the business plan this in, in 2022, and that will obviously come to council and that will talk about the costs of implementing these projects. We'll also likely have a timeline for, for doing some of these and, and then council will be able to review that and make changes as they see fit. That's always been the plan is to create the business plan following the approval of the master plan and that will then determine the uh, course of events after that. Thank you for that. Anything further? Then I will call a question all in favor of this Memorial Park master plan going forward. And that is carried with uh, thanks and uh, acknowledgement of all of the work that has gone in both staff and for our volunteer uh, commitment to this. this uh, next one is CAO 2021-21. The forced road allowance for the Holland Sydenham town line. I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table. Deputy Mayor and Councilor Greenfield, thank you. And the recommendation reads that Committee of the Whole recommend Council and Municipality approve the conveyance of a portion of the Holland Sydenham town line allowance to Kenneth Johnson in lieu of the dedication of the forced road located on part four. RP 16 R 695 to the municipality, provided the Township of Chatsworth concurs with the conveyance. And number two, direct staff to bring forward the necessary bylaws to enable the conveyance. Uh, cost, uh, questions or uh, comments on this? Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I guess it'd be to Rob, uh, Mr. Voigt. This is quite close to my property and I've uh, walked this and I've looked at it and I've measured it. And I really don't understand what the man is asking for. The piece of property that he is looking for is on such a hill, you would never be able to build on it in my mind. I'm not a building inspector, but you would also have to leave the original road allowance for an laneway for the property on the south side. So if you leave the original road allowance for that other property, give them the rest, you couldn't build a chick coop on it. I don't know what we're doing here. Over to you, Rob. Yeah, to your worship. Um, the baseline principle of this is that when the road was constructed uh, years ago, it went on to the Johnson property. Um, so the municipality, as the report indicates, either were obligated to either financially compensate him for that portion of the road 
or to give him the original road allowance. He's asked for the original road allowance. Um, so therefore it doesn't cost us any money in composition. We don't need the original road allowance for our purposes. So um, it was suggested that that would be the ideal thing. Whether he can get a building permit or can't get a building permit, that is, is up to him and his ability. This does not obligate us to issue a building permit on his newly enlarged parcel. Um, through the consultation component, if there is a required entrance, and that has been highlighted as a potential, that we could um, maintain an easement over that section for access to that person should they require it for access to their property. They do have quite a bit of land that also fronts the road allowance irrespective of, of this small little section. So that's something that can be dealt with through the, uh, through the dedication. Thank, Thank you, you, Rob. Um, anything else? Seeing nothing, so I will then call a question. All in favor of the recommendation as presented, and that is carried. The CAO 2021-22 is regarding a land donation of 116 William Street. And the recommendation reads that the Committee of the Whole recommend that Council approve the acceptance of the donation of 116 William Street. And of course, uh, the bring forward the correlating bylaws to enable the conveyance. I have a mover and a second to Councillor Bell. And Deputy Mayor, thank you. And comments, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. So um, in its principle of uh, the municipality of Meaford, uh, getting this property just off of William Street in between Thompson and Victoria, it's uh, a good, a good section of property. Um, we often hear at council when uh, folks come forward, they say that we don't have enough green space and uh, we can't go here and can't go there. I think that this is a good, uh, a good chunk of property. I do have a question though for um, Mr. Armstrong. So there is no, there's no money exchanged on this at all. And the value which was in our report we're not getting any of that value. What there is here is there's an exchange that the municipality gets the property and I take it for historical things that transpired in the past that the executors or whoever's in charge have said, if we can get rid of this, and we can give this to the municipality, we are happy to do so. Is that the, is that the crux of the issue? Yeah, through the your through your worship, uh, basically they've offered to donate the, donate the land in lieu of getting a tax receipt. Um, a tax receipt as a donation uh, is based on an appraisal appraisal that was completed in the lands. It can't be based on the assessed value. It has to be based on appraisal. An appraisal was obtained, uh, so a tax receipt which can benefit them for income tax purposes on the estate. Um, and then we get the lands free, uh, free of any required purchase price. Okay. okay. Councilor Greenfield. Thank you again, Mayor Clumpus. Through you to Mr. Armstrong uh, or Mr. Boyd. Um, is the municipality taking on any kind of liability uh, here? Uh, Peach Creek. Uh, has been known to flood in the past. Uh, I, I know that uh, due to some pond construction up on the, uh, on the golf course, that has somewhat alleviated the, uh, uh, the flooding or, or one, one factor. But um, I, I'm just worried that uh, uh, if indeed we should get a, a huge onrush of water uh, through this property that causes problems east of it, uh, are we setting ourselves up for uh, a, a potential liability here? Through your worship, um, the properties have been zoned and designated environmental protection because of the flooding of Peach Creek. Um, and this property uh, provides flood storage for that. I think in my opinion, liability would occur if we were to allow it to be developed, be filled, that could alter 
uh, the floodplain in another location. Uh, there is no liability in us owning uh, floodplain for pro floodplain protection. In fact, our official plan recommends that we acquire it for long-term protection. So it puts us in, to, to me in a better spot uh, for that purpose. Thank you. Okay. Comment further? And I will call the question. All in favor of this going forward, and that is carried as well. The next item we have on our agenda, CAO 2021-23, is a salary market review. And we do have a presentation from um, the proponent or the consultant involved here, uh, but she's not able to join us until three o'clock. So with council's um, permission and uh, agreement, um, I will uh, just park that for the moment and move on to community services, which is the next um, item. It is 2.30 and we have uh, been sitting for an hour and a half. Would anybody like a break at this point or should we move on? Looks like we're good to move on. Okay, then let's move on to community service, COM 2021-26. Uh, the uh, good news report, accessibility year-end report. I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table, Councillor Kentner and Councillor Greenfield. And the recommendation reads that Committee of the Whole receive the Legislative Compliance Summary Report for 2021 and to uh, receive the 2021 Accessibility Status Report. So um, I'm, we've all had a good read of this report. It certainly is a good news report. And we have um, our own Margaret um, Bolton Seagal to uh, thank for that and all of the work that she has done with a very, very um, ambitious committee. Um, certainly a very, very good report and, and good news that uh, makes our community shine in terms of uh, accessibility in, in Gray County. Are there any comments? Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I was just thinking how this uh, this report ties in with the uh, with the three presentations we had earlier in our meeting uh, from the Optimist Club, the Community Gardens, the Tom Thompson Trail. They're all a part of this safe and well-being community that we are trying to build, and I think thus far have done a good job. Uh, so, uh, no further comments. Um, Councillor questions. And I will call the question all in favor of receiving this report. With many thanks, Margaret, for your hard work. Appreciate that. It's great. Okay, moving on to COM 2021-27 is a retentions, uh, records retention bylaw update. And the recommendation reads that the committee of the whole recommend that the council and, uh, of the municipality enact a bylaw to establish record retention schedules. I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table. Councillor Bell, Councillor Vickers. Okay, again, another fulsome uh, report and a lot of good hard work has gone into this. Any comments or questions from Council? No? All good? Getting off easy, Margaret. <laughs> Uh, I think Thanks Councillor so Bell has a question, Madam Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your that, hand That's up. okay, uh, Madam Mayor. I did uh, flip my hand up uh, kind of late there, but not so much a question, uh, Mr. Clerk. I think all of us reading through the report, um, I just kept going page after page after page and just the unbelievable amount of items that we have that today, if you ask me to name three of them, I draw a blank because there's so many. <laughs> and I, I, you know, when, when you mentioned Mr. Clerk uh, in times past about culminating uh, Sydenham and St. Vincent in the town of Meaford and keeping your records uh, up to date, um, you have said that it is quite a, quite a full-time endeavor. And uh, I'm sure that all of us reading through that probably concluded the same thing that uh, you and your staff doing that to keep things organized and to keep things um, uh, according to how um, I suppose the law really requires things to be done that you are most definitely working diligently at that. So 
um, I think Madam Mayor, I just saying uh, well done. Thank you, Councillor Bell. I will call the question now and all in favor of receiving this report and that is carried as well. Um, let's move on now to updates uh, from the members. And the first one, of course, over to you, Deputy Mayor for County Council. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, Gray County Council did meet on November the 25th, last Thursday. Council began with a discussion on the motion brought forward at our prior meeting, which was approved and directed staff to research and report on several aspects of governance, including the term of warden, how the voting is conducted and weighted voting. It was suggested and supported on that day that in a recorded vote, we would add the following amendment that consideration be given to public access and participation processes as part of the governance information report. In addressing the minutes of the development charges steering committee of which I am a member, our director of planning at the county and deputy CAO Randy Scherzer presented a broad outline of revisions from our last meeting. Non-residential charges, which have not been levied in gray to date, but which are in many other jurisdictions will be phased in over five years. There'll be no charge in 2022, 25% of the charge in 2023, 50% in 2024, 75% in 2025, and 100% in 2026. For example, if a store the size of Walmart came into the county, the development charge would be $300,000 at 100%. It has been thought in the past that not charging DCs in this category would encourage commerce. We now believe that the time has come to implement development charges in this area of the economy. Deferrals and exemptions were reinforced for purpose-built rentals, secondary units, and most CIP projects. Council heard updates regarding the Sydenham campus. This project may be three years behind schedule, but I predict, predict a swift catch-up. The campus is a hub for business and entrepreneurism in gray. Phase one was massive renovation to the old public school adjacent to Georgian College. Phase two is seeing the beginning of service delivery with over 600 business inquiries over the past eight months, 109 one-on-one -on -one consultations, 27 workshops, and 11 speaking training sessions. Businesses receive support with everything from startup mentoring to succession planning. Staff from our Gray Bruce Business Enterprise Center, along with Catapult Gray Bruce, provide support with grant writing and navigating COVID. This is a networking site which intends to fill in the gaps for businesses and entrepreneurs. Staff are also focused on the tech sector and have purchased a fast lane license, which permits them to offer an additional level of consulting support. I'm sorry, consulting support. The official grand opening of the center is Thursday, December the 2nd, between 10 and 2 p.m. Drop by if you can. The Sydenham Center is the only business startup support facility nationally to receive funding from FedDev. We were the recipient of an $845,000 grant to support local operations going forward. We heard our 2021 corporate financial update and learned that the county is anticipating a year-end surplus of $24,200 or 0.04%. It doesn't get much better than that when you're looking at a total taxation level of $62,342,800. Warden Selwyn Buck Hicks delivered his final address for this term as Warden of Gray County. His remarks focused on the great accomplishments of county staff over the past year. Considering the challenges of the pandemic, much work and many projects have been realized. Warden Hicks is especially proud of the advancements in support for affordable housing, the commitment of 1% of the county's budget going forward and the addition of close to 100 new units overall, but mostly in Owen Sound. Warden Hicks spoke with praise for our long-term care homes where there were no deaths from COVID. Our paramedics and their outreach program, council support for the four year graduating nursing program coming next year to Georgian College, $17 million of road construction, advances with broadband through SWIFT initiatives and economic development support for businesses through the pandemic. And as always, if I've missed anything, your worship, please jump in. Not much, you've uh, covered it all very well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others uh, who have uh, something to report? Uh, Councillor Greenfield. 
Thanks, uh, Your Worship. Uh, uh, again, uh, Gray Salva Conservation Authority Board uh, did meet uh, last Wednesday uh, and uh, met virtually and decided that we would continue to meet virtually, uh, at least for the near future. Um, we received a budget update, an investment update, a reserves update, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of these things are going to tie in with some future renovations and repairs to the admin building uh, over at Grace Hall. Well, it's over 40 years old and uh, has a rather unique design that uh, maybe in today's world isn't uh, isn't the most accommodating but uh, maybe that's just my uh, uh, my opinion uh, let's talk about forming a, a eugenia falls management plan committee eugenia falls has been uh, incredibly busy uh, especially the last couple of years uh, uh, huge huge numbers not a big parking lot there there have been some uh, some problems but uh, it's a very very great attraction for uh, 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 for our county and uh, at one of the very few places that gold has ever been discovered in Gray County. However, the gold turned out to be pyrite, so uh, the gold rush was fairly abbreviated. Uh, we talked about uh, extending, uh, lengthening cutting site cycles for harvesting. Uh, currently, we, we try to harvest in various plantations at 15 years. And uh, we're finding that maybe the trees just aren't <laughs> maturing that much in 15 years. So we're maybe gonna go to a 20 year uh, cycle. A uh, couple of tenders for, uh, for some wood. And uh, um, it, it, was a, it was a lengthy meeting. Oh yes, we, we did have a, and all I'll say is that we had a closed session about a very irritating issue. Uh, Paul, what did what did I miss? <laughs> uh, geez, you got most of it. There is the little bit of a um, uh, water management report on uh, water management, which I had to duck out of the meeting a little early, so I don't know what became of that. On water management. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I, I didn't, I don't know why I missed that. Well, we can pick up on that. And yeah, okay, sorry about that. I, I didn't, Bell? I didn't that. Sorry, Councillor Bell, you had a uh, yeah. BIA meeting this week. I thanks, believe. thanks, Madam Mayor. Yeah, we did. So, uh, some good, uh, good news on this is that, uh, first of all, we had quorum. So, uh, the invitation that was put out uh, from uh, staff to uh, those that are involved at uh, the BIAs of uh, importance, uh, we had quorum. And the budget will be something that they're going to be looking at in the future, uh, with not having a couple of uh, uh, quorums previous. Uh, may be a little bit behind, but I'm pretty sure they'll all pull it together in time for uh, uh, ourselves being on council to approve their portion of a budget. Um, it was amazing that a number of the people who um, are in business in the BIA do watch council and uh, they did pick up on the uh, Committee of the Whole's conversation about paid parking, but uh, our council today has moved forward and so, you know, the letter that, you know, I support government and uh, we're going to be doing that, but uh, they did have some uh, opinions on it. And by the way, there was, there was split opinion on it. Um, something that is really, really quite neat. It's in the works and it's really quite dynamic. I hope it all can come together. It will change downtown at winter time and the Christmas New Year's period. If anybody has ever been um, down Kitchener, they have um, quite a vibrant activity with some small small little buildings they might be eight by eight but they have movable sides people come they can open up they can show things it's it's a work that they've talked about and i really hope i'm encouraging them to press forward with it uh, personally i've always thought that the winter time can be a 
kind of a blah period of time. And I, I know they're not going to let go of this. I know that uh, they're going to keep pressing forward with uh, the money. Um, who can uh, maybe help make these little kiosks? And I'm hoping that it will really do something um, for us downtown and for tourism. And uh, I know the chamber is heavily involved in it, very much so. And so it's going to be one of those endeavors between the chamber and the BIA that I think with all of the, uh, the people working together, I think, I think, Madam Mayor, that as time goes on, I hope that there'll be a time when, when we can clearly announce that there's going to be something like this happening. So now that I've kind of wet your whistle on the idea, if you meet anybody in the chamber or you meet anybody out of the BIA, um, encourage them to do this. It could really spark a, a really vibrant change. And um, the people who are going to do it, like always, they're going to be the unsung heroes making something happen. And we're all going to benefit from it. So uh, they're in the works. And uh, that's uh, nice when they get together and we have a meeting like that and people can bring uh, forward ideas like this. This is what uh, having a group like that's all about. So thanks. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Bell. Does that mean, are these little kiosks like maker spaces or uh, for um, uh, crafters or is that, is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. yeah all nice. those things, you know, like um, they, they said it was going to be based roughly on what happens down in Kitchener. And so of course they're, they're going to be looking for contracts, hopefully to find out how much these little kiosks are going to cost them, who's going to make them. And like all logistical things, where are they going to store them when it's not the season or can they use these for other activities? So the ideas uh, that were around the table, uh, you know, they just keep rolling and building upon one another. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it would be great. Excellent. Thank you for that. Do we have anything else uh, from around the table? Okay, that brings us to uh, the end of this section, and I don't want to move out of Committee of the Whole because we have one more remaining item to discuss. So I will I, uh, pause, I think, um, until we have our consultant join us, Mary and Love, um, at three o'clock. So we'll take a break.
I'll be taken to a local machine shop. We'll charge you shop minimum. He fixed my purse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> All right, just in time. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And uh, we are now on uh, CAO 2021-23 salary market review. And the recommendation reads that Committee of the Whole recommend Council approve the tw proposed 2022 salary framework with job rates reflecting the 50th percentile pay target and an annual economic increase adjustment of 1% effective January 1, 2022 and to adopt the practice of undertaking a periodic market review of all positions on a four-year cycle. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, to put that on the table? Councillor Bartley and Councillor Vickers, thank you. And with that, I will welcome our um, consultant, Marianne Love is here with us. And, um, you have a presentation, Marianne, I believe. Yes, I do, uh, Your Worship. And can everyone, I just want to do a sound check. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Please go ahead and welcome. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And uh, so I thought, um, uh, Madam Mayor, I would walk through the presentation and then perhaps take questions at the end if that works for you, or, or I'll take your lead. Um, I can't really see you folks, so I'm just... I'll just walk through, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll follow your lead. You just let me know what you'd like to do. Well, please let's go through your presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll hold qu questions until the end. That will okay. be easier for you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, we'll work through the background slide first. Okay, so by way of background, um, Meaford reviewed internal equity, pay equity, and the external pay market back in 2007. And at that time, they used a job evaluation system and a defined comparator group. The co compensation reviews were then completed again in 2011 and 2014 using the same foundational elements. Now, currently, the pay policy for the municipality targets the 50th percentile of the defined pay market. So knowing that as a background, we had our eye on how we were going to be placing ourselves or how we place ourselves today in relation to that target. So that was a focal point of the review. We know that job evaluation has been maintained by the municipality to capture changes in organization design and job content using existing tools and systems to ensure job equity and compliance with the Ontario Pay Equity Act. The salary grid, consists of 17 pay bands, and there are additional pay bands for part-time, seasonal, and student positions. The salary grid, I understand, has been adjusted annually to account for cost of living increases. Job rate, or maximum rate, uh, in the grid is set at step five, and there are 5% step differentials between each step to get to, to the step five rate, or the job rate. I was engaged by the municipality uh, this year to conduct a review of the current compensation program uh, in 2021, specifically to assess again the competitive pay market, the current pay policy target or the 50th percentile target, see how we stood up to that, update pay equity compliance and develop proposed rates for implementation in 2022. This uh, review is relating to municipal staff positions. A review of the volunteer fire service positions will be completed next year. Just by way of, of overview, I'll just move to the next slide. By way of overview, um, the um, job descriptions were updated by managers in collaboration with employees and facilitated by the manager of human resources. This is an important point because the job descriptions or the job content are a key underpinning in the success of this review. So we wanted to make sure that all job content was current. I completed a custom market study using 14 municipal comparator organizations. These organizations were selected having regard to 
some of the comparators we had used in the past, because the geographic placement of our comparators and certainly having regard to measures of size and scope of service. I reviewed the updated job information, the job descriptions for all of the positions, and I used the same job evaluation system to evaluate those jobs. And that system is supporting the pay equity plan that was put together uh, back in, in the 2000s. The current banding framework was tested. So the banding framework is basically the left-hand side of the grid. It was tested to make sure that those bands would continue to support organization growth and job design. Uh, I proposed 2021 job rates based on the competitive pay market, and I tested for pay equity compliance. From there, I put together a 2021 salary grid framework because all field work was completed this year. Understanding we won't be implementing until next year. So that the, 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 the framework grid, if you will, the 2021 grid was aged or adjusted by 1% to bring us into 2022 for implementation costing. I'll go to the next slide. This slide sets out Meaford's approach to compensation. So as you said in the history, as you saw in the history in the background, we've looked at compensation in 07 and 2011 and 2014. So certainly our philosophy in, in, at Meaford ad addresses and has addressed historically these four key principles. Uh, and, and as with many councils across the province, province. We want to make sure that we are paying internally fairly. So we have internal equity. We can say we have internal equity when all jobs are evaluated uh, in, in a fair and objective manner using uh, the job evaluation system and the jobs are placed within the bands. We also want to make sure we're compliant with the Ontario Pay Equity uh, Act and making sure there are no pay gaps for female positions in relation to male comparator roles. We also want to make sure that we're competitive with the pay market. So market competitiveness is also a key element. And affordability is also key as well. So the ability to pay. These four um, principles have been alive and well um, at, at Meaford, but they, the underpinnings, the, the um, considerations and the environment uh, within them change. For example, market, the market competitiveness within the municipal sector has changed, and we can see this in the re results of this review. Internal equity changes or how our jobs are, are described and designed, and we want to make sure that we have those accurately reflected in terms of point values and band placement. So these periodic reviews allow us to touch on all of the elements that are at the bottom end of the slide here where we are looking at current job information. We make sure that the jobs are fairly scored and placed in pay bands. We take a look at the, um, the, uh, the uh, agenda analysis, ensuring there are no pay gaps, and we're compliant with the Ontario Pay Equity Act. Those steps one, two, and three are all internal to Meaford. Step four is taking a look at how uh, our positions in Meaford are comparing to the competitive pay market. And step five is putting all those pieces together. Steps one to five relate to positions, not people. All right, the employees are picked up through another program, very important program that would relate to performance management. Okay, so how individuals or how our employees progress through the steps would relate to employee performance. The framework itself is relating to the elements that we see on the screen here at the, the bottom end of the screen. I'll go to the next slide. So just in terms of summary, the 50th percentile pay target is recommended as representative, conservative, and reasonable having regard to the scope, size, and composition of the 2021 comparator group in relation to the municipality of Meaford. So I'm not suggesting that we increase it, um, but we are gapped in some areas. So we have some work to do to uh, get back to or get to the confirmed pay target of previous days. On aggregate, we are paying uh, below the 50th percentile of the defined group with greater deviation in some positions. So what this is meaning in some cases, we're a bit more competitive than we are in others. And this review will shore this up so that we can bring all jobs in to be more, much more reflective of the, the pay target of 50th percentile. 
The current banding framework can support the organization design and the placement of the positions based on the content of the job, internal equity and the market. The updated framework that I put together that sits that supports the new grid addresses these elements. We have internal equity for all positions because all positions are placed in the pay bands using consistent interpretation and application of the JE system. We have pay equity compliance because all female job classes have a job rate that is equal to, I wouldn't say necessarily greater, but at least equal to the male comparator job rate. Pay policy is also addressed in the framework because we have job rates that are reflective of the 50th percentile target of the defined group. And we'll go to the next slide. So I'm just going to focus on a few elements here. The internal equity and pay equity compliance will be addressed on this slide. So as I said earlier, internal equity has been maintained by the municipality by evaluating new and changed positions using the 12 factor job evaluation system that produced the current ending framework. And that's been a longstanding practice. I've been able to support the municipality for a number of years in job evaluation and maintenance uh, activities. The, the, and this also goes a long way to maintaining currency with the pay market. So we've done a lot of that work already. Uh, the system in uh, the job evaluation system includes factor language and weight allocation that supports organization design, leadership and decision making models. It's been accepted by pay equity re review services and the job evaluation system is widely used in the municipal sector. So you'll have a very robust tool to measure job equity. The banding framework holds jobs of similar value and it supports the current grid. The banding framework methodology that was put together years ago and has continued to be used is defined by an increasing point spread, five point spread. And this has been retained for this review. Okay, it also supports compliance efforts. I reviewed the positions and the job evaluation ratings were updated. As a result of this, three positions moved in band placement based on the content of the jobs, the application of the rating system, and the pay equity banding framework. Again, and this, these movements were supported by the pay market. Had we not done such extensive work over the years on evaluating new and change positions, I think we would have had more changes. Um, so this is reflective of the good maintenance practices the HR folks have had in place um, oh, since, since the last review. And this is why it's only three that have moved up the ladder chart. Pay equity compliance was reviewed for all positions. The job-to-job -job method of comparison is prescribed by the legislation uh, using male comparators for female job classes was used for 45 female roles. Pay equity is being maintained. There's one pay equity impact that's identified in this review and we're able to address that through implementation of the new salary grid. We'll go to the next one. So that's steps one, two, and three, if we reflect back on that graphic that was shared with you a few slides previous. And now we're, this slide is focusing on the external pay market review. The market comparator group is selected to reflect relevant scope and criteria. And so when, you know, there's no, per, I have to say in all my years of doing this work, there's no perfect set of comparators. We try to get a set of comparators that are reasonable and to give us enough, uh, it has, needs to be large enough to be able to provide suitable number of matches for positions. We select our comparator group based on criteria. The criteria, we look at geographic location, so urban rural mix, proximity to larger centers, economic conditions is an important criteria, Sim similar service alignment. So those organizations that are providing like services, they would have jobs we would be able to match to. And certainly size is an indicator. There's lots of measures of size, inclusive of operating budget, population tax base service size. So for this review, we have 14 comparators. Six of the 14 comparators were used to assess market competitiveness for the part-time seasonal and student positions as well. A little more difficult to get uh, robust job matches because they do, these positions do vary amongst our comparator organizations, but we were able to get enough market, uh, market matches to be able to assist us and reflect on the pay, our, our competitive competitiveness for this group. We'll go to the next slide, please. 
So this slide shows the group of comparators. You can see Meaford is, is, uh, is shown at the bottom of slide. And you can see there's just a couple of, of, of features that are noted here. So we've got, I've listed the, in, with an asterisk, the, the municipalities that provided data for us to take a look at the part-time seasonal positions. The um, county district is noted in the middle column, so it gives you a sense of geographic placement, but then I expect you probably know, know it anyway. And then of course, population is just one of the metrics that um, is considered with regards to size. And while this is old data, it's 2016 stats can, it's what's up and, and, and at the ready. The, the newer um, information is, 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 not, is not posted, um, but it gives you a sense of relativity. Okay, just in terms of, of size. And you can see that where Meaford is sitting, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's pretty close to around the middle of the pack in relation to size and a few, few you know, thousand up or down is not necessarily material really with, with these reviews. It's just that these reviews in terms of looking at, uh, looking at the comparator data, we're trying to get um, positions that we're, we're able to sort of match with a degree of reliability. And on the next slide, it'll talk a little bit about the approach that I took to the market matching itself. So when I'm doing a market review, I'll be matching the positions in, in the home municipality, so in this case, Meaford, to similar positions and comparator organizations. To do that, we take a look at um, things such as job title, job information, organization charts. And when we're matching, we, we run, um, uh, we, we make sure we re are recording the 2021 annual, so the salary, and also the uh, um, 2021 hourly job rates. And job rate is the maximum rate of pay. So we compare our max rates uh, for annual and hourly to the max rates that are provided by the comparators. So the other thing that uh, I, I have brought to the project is certainly a high degree of familiarity with the comparator data. Um, I've used data from each one of these organizations for either this assignment in years past or for other for other, um, for, sorry, for other comparators, uh, uh, not comparators, for other um, municipalities that have undergone market reviews. And some of these organizations are clients in and of themselves. So I have a high level of familiarity with the positions, the grids, the organization design, and, um, and the job content. Now, having said that, uh, I still apply as conservative lens to job matching, I want to make sure that all outlier matches are removed. So an outlier match would be if the scope of duties were a little bit off, a little different, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to use that match. Um, a, a, a high, high pay or a low, low pay is also signifying within the market match is not highly reliable. So the matches are tested fine-tuned and then ultimately the summary is prepared. So always making sure that those matches and the, and the analysis are not going to skew results. Where it is I'm able to get three or more matches on a position for a position, I'm able to determine the ranking of or the comparison comparability of our position at Meaford to the position where I to 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 the to the statistic that's been put together for the for the three or four matches. And when we talk about percentiles, because this is how we're comparing in the pay market, we're really thinking about how we're rank, how we fare on a rank order. So for example, if I had a position with six matches, we had six other comparators that had reasonable matches for a position, we'd be able to determine what the 50th percentile value of those six matches are. And if we rank ordered those matches, highest match to lowest match, the 50th percentile would be the value uh, of which 49% or 50% of, of the, the values were higher and 50 lower. So it gives us a sense of that. That's also a median. A 60th percentile value runs a little higher. And so if we're looking at 70th, it'd be a higher number as well. So the 50th percentile is where Meaford has historically positioned itself within the pay market. And we paid particular percent attention to that metric going through this exercise. The markets, a market summary was prepared and it indicates that on aggregate, the job rates for me for positions are low to the competitive pay market target. 
of uh, 50th percentile and you know, with greater deviation in some positions. So to turn that around, we are a little more competitive in some positions than others. And these periodic reviews will show that. They will, um, they will uncover that phenomenon. And so this is, this is what we wanna pay particular attention to as we look at the pay, the pay market placement and putting our grids together for the, the go forward. The pay rates for the part-time seasonal and student positions were seen to be competitive uh, for basically all positions other than for crossing guard. And so we needed to do something that's one of the three positions that were identified earlier. We'll go to the next slide, please. So this slide is, is indicating sort of a, the aggregate comparison. So if we are looking at um, how our jobs on aggregates or on the whole are faring to the, the market, the competitive pay market, we're about 2.3% below. So we'd have to increase our, on the whole, our job rates by about 2.3% to get to the 50th percentile. And of course, we're a little further behind if we're looking at a higher target. Uh, if we'd be back by 4.6%. We're, we're a little more competitive when we look at our hourly rates. And that is just simply because, so we'd have less to increase. You can see a smaller number there. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and the reason for that is when we compare to our municipal partners, uh, they don't all have the same hourly rates for all of their positions. So we, you know, it's quite common to see positions that may be 35 hour work week or 37 and a half or 40 hours, and we take them as they come in. So it is what it is. It's just a reflection of the pay market. All right. So it doesn't mean, this does not mean that we can become competitive by simply applying 2.3% to our current grid. We don't. We 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 come out of this review with more precision than that. So what we've done more specifically is take a look at the pay bands themselves and adjust where we need to adjust. Now, there's no doubt that the revised band placement for some positions I've identified those three has aligned their pay rates closer to the pay market based on internal equity. So that's of some assistance. And also of great assistance here is the job evaluation maintenance work that has been done since the lot between you know since since the last review. However, we do see we're still lagging and we're lagging predominantly in for management positions that are sitting in bands 11 and up. And this is not a surprise, at least to me, um, with the amount of, of market work that I do in municipalities across the province. This is quite in keeping with market observations for, for, for others. Um, <clears throat> there are both, both within the local area and across the province. And this is predominantly due to the age demographic in the sector, in the municipal sector, and the challenges that we've experienced across the sector in attracting and retaining top talent. This, is, this, this challenge was upon, was thrust upon, or was experienced by municipalities before COVID, during COVID, and has been exacerbated, I think, coming out of COVID. There's a lot of, I think, more employee choice in terms of where they're working, and it's causing a lot of stress on pay structures and pay frameworks and other elements of, of rewards as well. And we'll go to the next one. <clears throat> the majority of the positions that are currently sitting on the 2021 wage grid are sitting below the 50th percentile, not all, but the majority. So the contributing factors to the current market placement are these. Uh, many of the comparators that you saw listed on that previous slide have conducted a salary review in the last five years, and they have adjusted their salary grids accordingly. And many of the comparators have revisited their compensation policy. And where they may have been 50th percentile targets in the past, they may have adjusted their, their percentile target and or so to higher to a higher target and they may also some have also adjusted their comparator pool so comparing themselves to a different group of comparators and again this is reflective of the churn in the sector and and this is i think why we find ourselves somewhat behind and the other factor 
could well be, and I didn't put as, as, as deep of a lens on this, but where it is, for example, in say the last five years on aggregate, we have not adjusted our grids by the same amounts as some of our comparators on average, that will create a bit of a gap as well. So these things happen. And this is why we do periodic reviews to shore things up and to mitigate, to mitigate those gaps. We'll go to the next slide. The, uh, it's recommended that Meaford confirms a pay policy that establishes job rates that target the 50th percentile. I'm not suggesting that you go higher. I'm suggesting that you, you retain it, retain your current pay targets, but ensure that your salary grid job rates are uh, at or reflective of that pay target. And we've got some gaps to shore up, as I said earlier. And this is having regard to the size and the scope of the comparator group, the conservative approach to job matching that I used throughout the, the, the project, attraction and retention challenges, the geographic placement, economic conditions, and certainly external influencers. And I talked a bit about those external influencers on the previous slide. I prepared a job rate for each band that's reflective of the 60, or sorry, the 50th percentile target. Bands 10 and 14 are empty and they can be used for future growth. And that's a good thing. It's good to have bands that are empty. And then when a job is, is created or a job changes, it can go to that empty band with a lower job rate than a band that would be up above that if we didn't have the job of an empty band to receive it. So this is a, a good way to mitigate costs. And it's a it's it's a it's 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 a positive thing to have in your framework. So that's by design. The current job rates were retained were competitive, as I said earlier. They are competitive for bands four and five. So we don't need to change those beyond a COLA adjustment on the grid for 2022. The bands with job rates that require adjustments show increases in job rate rates that are ranging from 0.8% in band six to 5.6% in band 17. Now I understand there are cost impacts to put this together, but they aren't the, the I've, I've seen bigger gaps uh, over the course of the last uh, you know two months when I've been delivering these reports into councils across the province. I'm not minimizing them. I think that, uh, but they are what they are. And if we don't minimize them through this review, the gaps will, uh, will, will widen as we move forward to the next review. So I'm recommending that council give consideration to shoring up these gaps with the recommended uh, framework that's been proposed. And we'll go to the next one. Now, because we did all of the field work this year and we're not implementing until 2022, I've aged the 22 or 2021 salary grid produced a 2022 salary framework. And we can use that for implementation costing using, and it consists of a five-step progression model with 5% between each step. That's what you currently have. So I haven't changed the model. I've just changed the maximum rates. And of course, some of the jobs are in different bands based on content. The, and the, and the, this banding framework supports your salary grid up the 50th percentile, and we've included our 1% economic adjustment. And the implementation costs can be mitigated and phased in by using a next closest step or a variation of this approach. So what that's meaning is that basically we're taking the 2021 actual rates and we're, we're moving those in individuals with those actual rates, whatever steps they may be in, into the, the new grid, as opposed to going, say, for example, max rate to max rate. This is a, a, a popular practice across the sector, it provides a retention strategy and it allows the organization to ensure that the step movement is, is set out with, uh, with performance. It's aligned with performance. And typically organizations will have robust performance management programs that will marry up with the salary grid administration. We'll go to the, I think we're on to the last slide now. So by way of summary <clears throat> recommendations, I'm, I'm, I'm recommending that the following um, recommendations uh, be, be adopted. I'm uh, recommending that the municipality uh, adopt the proposed 2022 salary framework 
with job rates reflective of the 50th percentile and an annual economic adjustment of 1% effective January 1st, 2022. I'm also recommending the municipality adopt the practice of undertaking a periodic market review of all positions on a three to four year cycle in order to ensure competitive pay practices in light of changing demographics and work practices in the sector. This has become a best practice in the sector. Councils are, and, and organizations are now looking at their, their uh, market placement with a higher frequency than in the past to ensure they're not overpaying or underpaying positions. The annual increases to the salary grid can be determined by conducting an annual review of comparative municipalities just to see what it is they are putting forward for their grid increases. It's important that we keep our eye on, if not all of them, at least a good, good subset of that comparator group between now and the next cyclical review. This information, together with information that would relate to, say, locally negotiated increases, CPI increases, which are published in typically around this time of the year, and published surveys projecting following your, your increases will inform council in determining appropriate grid adjustments, and of course, have regard to ability to pay. So just before I finish, I just want to reflect on the 1%. The 1% increase is, is, is certainly conservative. Uh, in, in light of what I'm seeing across the province, in light of published CPI um, numbers. So we've got a, 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 a CPI number of, or an OMORS published it, I think it was last week, uh, with 2.744% increase. And that was an October over October uh, averaging formula they, they used. Um, I've had another municipality that came in, I think it was 4.09 or 4.7. They took a month over month snapshot, which was very high. But I think the more normative is the 2.74. Um, I'm not, not suggesting that, that, that the 1% be quashed and moved to a higher. I'm just saying it's a conservative adjustment. And I think that staff have worked very hard to try to bring forward a, a market competitive grid reflective of the already approved percentile target and bring it into 2022 with some conservatism. Um, and I think we would need to keep our eye on the comparator group to see what it is they put uh, forward with their grids this year and then see what we need to do for 2023. So um, I think with that, um, your, your worship, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Marianne. A very thorough presentation for sure. Uh, open it up to uh, comments, questions, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. So um, I will ask uh, Marianne if she wanted to pull back her uh, slide page number nine. Um, I thought I understood uh, math a little bit anyway, and I know what an average is and I know what a, what a mean is but I looked up if I could find out how to do a mathematical calculation for an aggregate. And an aggregate came up saying it was a mixture of a culmination for a new um, product. So when your report was saying that you've, you've pulled together an aggregate comparison, you, I need an explanation then as to when you were looking at, at municipalities that were paying greater than the 50th or, or, I don't know, I suppose you could have even looked at some that might have been um, slightly less than the 50th. You've used a terminology called aggregate for aggregate comparison. And to me, I'm a little lost on that terminology because that's not telling me what the average is out there or what a mean could be out there. You've used terminology that uh, from my seat, I just need a further explanation of the word aggregate. Yep, through, through you, Madam Mayor, I can address that. And I think it's just, and, and, and I apologize for the confusion because aggregate is not meant to be a more defined compensation term. And just saying overall, if I'm looking at, you know, the percentage differences for all, uh, all positions where I was able to um, provide three or more matches, we have some that are plus that we need to add, like we have to add, to, to, to achieve that percentile target and some are already competitive. On an summative basis, overall, are we up or are we down? Overall, we're down. We have to increase 
are are um, we are, we are down by two point three percent. As I said, it don't I don't think all this is doing is giving us a directional flow. So if we could change the word aggregate to say overall comparison, that's where the two point three comes from. If I was to produce the market summary, you would see. Where, for example, and I'll give you the, the and I, I, I referenced this, the CIO is five per, is five point seven percent below market. So that's one of the uh, data points that's included in the overall or aggregate summary. But I have probably I haven't counted them up anywhere where I've got more than three, which is most of the jobs in the organization. I'm able to see which ones are up, which ones are down, and overall we're down, we're down by 2.3%. So it's a it's a high level measure, that's all it is. And much more precision is, is, is derived, and this is how the project ensued, by not applying 2.3%, but applying a, an increase to the specific bands that needed them. So bands four and five didn't need them. We needed to put more, more of an increase to band 17, and I think it was only 0.8 to, to band eight. So. I think the, the greater precision is on a per band basis as opposed to the on aggregate, but it's just a direction. Are we up or are we down? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the council, Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And Marianne, thank you very much. I actually have three little questions. Uh, we share a border several, several kilometers with Chatsworth. Why wasn't Chatsworth Part of our comparator list. I, I, and that I, through you, Madam Mayor, I think that's a good question, but I think it's largely to do with size. Um, I don't think they're, um, I, I have used Chatsworth. I've used Chatsworth for other reviews. Um, I don't believe we've used them historically, and I think it was really size that was of the greatest concern. I'm trying to get organizations that would have a, not, not the same number of, um, of positions, but similar in order to get the leveling correct. And that's predominantly why I, I wouldn't be able to get the greatest matches with Chatsworth, and that's why I did not consider them. So it would be more positions than population. Yes, because I think that that's exactly it, uh, Councillor. Because when I'm doing a uh, when I'm doing a, a market review, I'm trying to get robust, reliable, and defensible position matches, and that's where we run our comparison statistics from. We look at our we look at that. So if I can't get good matches from a, an organization that's really large or really small, it's not helpful. Okay, thank you. Because I know with population, you've used two or three, actually three other municipalities with the same population. So yes. I understand. I understand where you're going from. Yeah. And may I ask another question, Madam Mayor? Yes, please go ahead. So I think you've answered my question. On your summary, you put a target of annual economic adjustment of one percent. That's actually COLA, correct? That's right. That's I another. Which is, yeah, that's it. Yes. I didn't time. know whether you were asking for that plus the COLA, which is going to come later. No, that's it uh, through you, Madam Mayor. That's it. And again, it's just another sort of reminder through further to the 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 um, the question the previous councillor asked. It's about the vernacular and the jargon that's used in these reviews. So I I'm, I appreciate the question. Right. And if we accept this as recommendations going forward, we don't have to stick to the one percent. That can go up or down. Um, through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, it could go up. I wouldn't suggest it go down. I think you'll have a, a, again, it's a matter of trying to get the best fit you can on each year. Cause if we go lower, we may be that much further behind the next year. So it's trying to do the best we can each year, having regard to the ability to pay. Um, and I think as your budget ensues, as you follow, you'll probably get a pretty good sense of what your comparators are paying to get yourselves comfortable about that 1% and you could make an adjustment and a determination as you work through your budget process. Yeah, that is correct. But if uh, the CPI, everything went to hell in a handbasket, was in the minus for one year, then 1% 1 might be high. So I'm saying we can go up or down, and but watch the comparators, I understand that. Yes. My last question, if I may, mm -hmm. how do I or the rest of council get a hold of some of the documents that you put your summary together with. I know other municipalities went into closed session and received all that documentation. I would like to receive that. Is that possible? 
Um, well, through you, through you um, Madam Mayor, the, the the actual market summaries and things of that nature, they're, they're handed over to staff. Um, the source data, the source data is typically held by me, although staff may have grids. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll follow the lead of staff on that in terms of whether or not there will be a further closed session um, and whereby, in, and as we get into more granular data it becomes more granular discussion and that's likely better suited for a closed session. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship and Marianne. Thank you for such an in-depth and thorough presentation. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask you, and I know you touched on it from uh, Councillor Bartley's question again about uh, municipal comparators. And I notice, um, you know, Owen Sound and Town of Blue Mountains being our neighbors and recognizing, I suspect the concern that, uh, you know, we have the potential of losing our staff to, to those communities being close by, but also recognizing that uh, one of our uh, comparison philosophies is, is to keep our wages affordable for the municipality and, and realizing that the town of Blue Mountains is quite a wealthy municipality um, with perhaps their ability to pay a little bit grander than ours. So I just wondered if you could share a little bit more about how you chose those comparators. I know you said it was because of your familiarity with them, but just in terms of the affordability side of it, I just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit, Marianne. Sure, through you, um, through you, Madam, Madam Mayor. I, I think it's important that they're brought in for comparison to, to count your point counselor. They, they are neighbors and you, you, you would be competing with them. Now, whether or not you can pay the same rates, I don't, I, 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 I'm not suggesting that, but if you, that goes to the percentile chosen and, um, and that ability to pay. So that's how we shore up the ability to pay. The fact that we can't pay what they pay or we can't, we're not as rich as they are, for lack of better descriptor, in my view, does not take them out of the comparison bucket. It's a consideration for what you do with the results from the comparison. How do you receive those results? What can we do with them? So the ability to pay is very much related, I think, to the percentile target that forms part of then your pay policy. If it were that Meaford had um, the spoils of riches, which many, many municipalities don't, but let's just say they did, you might be able to go a little higher than the 50th. You might be able to target the 55th or the 60th, right? But, but, but I, I, I haven't suggested that based on circumstance, and I appreciate what you're saying. But just because um, they are able to pay a bit more, I don't think we would take them out of the comparator pool. I would use it on the percentile value uh, consideration. Your Worship, thank you. That's very helpful, Marianne. I appreciate that uh, discussion and just wanted to, uh, I guess, remind Council that when we had the presentation uh, from our remuneration committee, part of that presentation did, did uh, uh, make us aware from their research that our staff are certainly not overpaid. So just uh, to remind us of that. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you for the Councilor Bartley. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, I appreciate you giving me another chance at the mic. <clears throat> this is this is something that I I can see myself supporting, but I would like to defer it for right now until we get some documentation to to back up these figures. And we haven't even seen our budget yet. Our budget is coming forward in a couple of weeks, and I'd hate to not be able to whittle down an eight percent budget and then add this to it. Uh, is there a chance we could defer this for a few weeks? Yeah, over to you, Matt. For uh, that. Through you, Madam Mayor, absolutely. Um, what I would suggest is that you propose a motion to defer it until the budget day is in January. Uh, that will give you the opportunity to hear the initial budget presentation in December and, and consider that for a few weeks and, and then do it you know, during that period of time. And we, we'd have the report similar to an announcement report. Thank you, Matt. And so I propose that we that. defer that to budget deliberations in January. Okay. And is there a seconder for that motion, Councillor Bell? All right. Any further discussion on this motion that this uh, decision be deferred, Councillor Kentner? 
I guess, uh, you know, if, if we weren't already behind, I, I would say by all means, but I'm not sure if, if in fact we are lagging behind, then um, I, I think we would have to, if we find that we're faced with an 8% increase, we're going to have to look other places for it probably. Deputy Mayor. Uh, Your Worship, thank you. And I appreciate the sensitivity, but from my perspective, in recognition of the terrific staff that we do have, and also recognizing the challenges in, uh, you know, replacing staff, we found that with staff vacancies. And, and uh, I would hate to think that we would leave staff today you know, worrisome of, of what we might do with this going forward. And I, I would like to see us make a decision today just for the, uh, um, the comfort level of, of our staff. And uh, I just, uh, I think it's important that we don't leave them kind of wondering. Thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. And just a further comment to that. This is uh, the salary framework that we're talking about here. The final decision with regard to the budget uh, will be will come through discussions and the budget pro during the budget process. Uh, yes and no, uh, Madam Mayor. Once, if you were to approve the grid, um, then that just becomes that what becomes is in the budget. Good. So it will be very difficult to sort of back that out afterwards i was thinking more along the lines of uh, increases or whatever absolutely yeah okay is there any further discussion on the motion to defer this discussion until um, the budget time seeing no further questions on this i will call a question all in favor of the um deferring this until uh, the times when we discuss this during the budget. Do you want a, a further explanation? What, pardon me, Madam Mayor, what did you just call? The, uh, this, is a, the, this is a motion to defer this to this particular um, acceptance recommendation until such time as we are into budget discussions. Have I said that correctly, Matt? Okay. So the question is, uh, yes, we're going to defer it, or no, we are not going to defer the, the uh, decision. If this fails, then we will vote then on uh, the grid as is proposed here. Okay, is that clear, everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll call the question again. All in favor of the deferring this discussion at this point until we are into the budget discussions in January. One, two, three, and those against, and that is lost. So now we go into the um, decision with regard to the recommendation as presented that we approve the proposed 2022 salary framework with job rates reflecting the 50th percentile pay target and an annual economic increase adjustment of 1% effective January 1, with the 1% being the COLA. Councillor Vickers. If I could just ask for uh, clarification, it talked about uh, since it was going to be a, a, an increase of, uh, of a certain percent that they're going to phase it in. Does that mean it will be phased in or will not? Does it talk, it doesn't say it in the, uh, at the top, but it does talk about phasing when you get towards the end of the. Uh... So through you, Madam Mayor, the so the option exists. If we were to actually proceed and implement this, we could do it all in one foul swoop, which would mean um, I'll use myself as an example. So if my position is at step five of the band. I would immediately effective January 1st be at step five of wherever my position um, is on the new band. Okay, so I would immediately get whatever that increase is effective January 1st. If we defer it, which is a more gentle way of bringing this in, I would move to step five when it becomes my time to, to have had a, a, a step increase, which is on my anniversary date. So 
for every employee, we would basically be implementing this as they reach their natural date for their next progression. Does that answer your question? And so just to sort of add to that, this motion would be the full implementation immediately. If you wanted to amend it to do the phased approach, then we'd need a, a motion to amend it by adding the words, uh, approve the proposed 2022 <laughs> framework flexing the 50th percentile pay target with a with a phased approach okay i so move you so move all right is there a seconder for that and that is seconded by <coughs> deputy mayor that uh, this uh, motion be accepted with the amended version that it be phased in uh, so that salary increases would commence on, on the regular date of um, employment uh, through you, you your uh, worship uh, sorry i was confused uh, i thought the motion we were dealing with was that we were simply deferring a decision on this grid until uh, we saw what the budget looked like but i i believe that what we're voting on is something quite different then which is uh, phasing in rather than uh, um, no the the motion to defer was reject was lost okay Okay, so now we're back to making a to deciding on the <coughs> recommendation as presented. But if we accept it as it is presented now, it will be uh, it will be um, enacted immediately uh, on the acceptance of the budget. So I if guess we I phase would just, it in the I, recommendation to or the amended motion is to phase it in so that any uh, step increases would occur. So uh, if I may speak to that, uh, I. I I think we're still in the same position, and that is we're, we're behind the eight ball, and in some cases uh, by a fair bit. So um, I, think, um, I think I'm in favor of, uh, of uh, giving this, uh, adopting this at this time. Thank you. Okay. So, Councillor, Deputy Mayor, did you want to speak? No, I'm fine. You're just <laughs> I'm trying to read what you're, <laughs> oh my what, what message you're sending me here. <laughs> okay, so we do have a motion, Councillor Vickers. Yeah, so, so before you call the question, I'd just like to, uh, I can appreciate that we're behind in, uh, in our wages and, and salary. And, you know, just to try and make it somewhat more palatable that I thought, you know, at least phasing it in does kind of basically take it over a two-year period. Would that be a fair assessment? Sean, um, it, won't, it won't all happen in 2022. So, it, it will happen in 2022 and finish off in, in 2023. So yes, that, that's sort of accurate. So the costing difference is actually in the staff report. You can see the difference mm -hmm. um, in there. Yeah. And it, yes. So if everybody had their salary increase January 1, that means it's a full year of everybody at the new salary rate. If there's a phased approach, it means some people are January 1 because that's when they were hired and some people are December 1 because that's when they were hired. It's not a full year of savings. It's just, it reduces some cost because it, and it all depends on hire date. A lot of people are hired in January. So the difference that you see in the two numbers is not, um, it's not huge, it's, it's significant, but it's not um, massive. So I think it's about $40,000 difference, if that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm reading it right, it says uh, the financial impact uh, would be $127,937 if it was done immediately. Yeah. If right. we use the phasing option, which is what my amendment is suggesting we, yeah. we do, it'll be down to 91561 for the 2022 budget, but then it would catch up in the 2023 budget. That's right. That's right. Okay. So that's why I'm speaking in favor of it. I think, uh, you know, as much as we need to, uh, to catch up, um, you know, we do have uh, financial considerations to, uh, you know, towards the, uh, the people in the municipality of Meaford. So that's my, uh, that's my reason for the uh, motion. Yeah, understood. Any further clarification needed? Councillor Bell. Thanks, Madam Mayor. So, so inside the report, um, If we, if we adopt this, and if it does transpire on January 1, 
And the report is telling us that the 50th percentile that we are behind. And yet the report also mentioned it is truly based upon our ability to pay. And if my fellow councillors recall budget time 2021, did a calculation and I was really close on tax supported finances for all the wages for our municipality. And in our report, we've also read a totality number. And where I have a fear on this is that when we do our 2022 budget, that number for the wages for the municipality of Meaford, having, a, and this number also is, can be challenged or clarified. I, I believe that we have over hundred people running the municipality full and part-time combined. I, I think that we're slightly just over 100. And when I see a municipality of over, over 11,000, we're probably closer to 12. And I see the operating budget having um, for the staff of 100, well over 7 million. It's over seven and a half in our report. This is where I have, I guess maybe I'm the only one, but I have reservations in all of this that yes, our, our top comparators that were, that were listed and our, and our top band numbers, some of our personnel are behind by five or $6,000 a year. And that is where we are financially at. So no matter what we do heading into the 2022 budget, the desire of this council is to make the 50th percentile the benchmark and to have that, we as councillors are going to need to have um, some good grounding on presenting all of this to the ratepayers. I believe that this is something that they are going to want to know how when we make a collective decision, how, how we all truly felt about this, because this is operating. This is what it takes to run the municipality. Our wages are part of that. Buying fuel is part of that. Everything we do is part of running the business of having a municipality. And for tonight's discussion, we're talking about our employees, according to the consultant, we're behind. And so in order to be in that band, they need technically a raise. And I just, I hope I have expressed this as kind and as, you know, as mild as I can. But I think that when we see the 2022 budget, I, I think we're going to be seeing over 8 million. And we can talk that number differently by, by $500,000, just talking about this, you know, your, your Canada pension or your EI and all the other payments that the municipality has to pay to have an employee. And so those, those numbers are going to be up there. So we are going to see a substantial increase, even greater than what I've read inside the report. So I appreciate staff. I appreciate their positions. Even the report that our clerk put forward on, on records retention, unbelievable work, an ongoing work and steady work. So most definitely I, I value them, I value the positions that they have, but I guess it comes down to the, to the finances of all of this. And maybe I'm taking it a little bit strong for having to hold the seat as a counselor and hold the line on where we're going with finances. So if my fellow counselors approve this and go with that, I definitely can go with it. But I just needed for everybody to think about what we're gonna see in the 2022 budget because those numbers will be there because they have to be. And then we'll, we will be looking at them then. So I hope it's been appreciated what I've said, Madam Mayor. Thank you for your, for your comments. Three, Sorry, Madam Mayor, just a point of information. Um, I, I won't say that 7.5 million is an exact number because things change and probably have since this report was written, but that number is based on our existing staff count for what's supposed to be in the budget. It's not based on last year's salary numbers or it's, it's based on what we're budgeting for. Thank you. Year. Thanks. Um, 
I think we all, sorry, Councillor Greenfield, go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I just need some clarification or a little more information. Um, uh, the existing salaries are seven and a half million uh, approximately. And uh, if we go up to uh, the 50th percentile, we're looking at uh, about another 128,000. That seven five is, we've still got pension and benefits. Like at, at one time, I, I well, more than one time, I, I was told that uh, uh, for pension benefits, you add about 24% onto salaries. Now, is, is that still in effect? Is this seven, seven, five? It's an all inclusive awesome. figure. So it already, it already covers pension benefits and life insurance and so on. It's a total cost, total employee cost. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Appreciate knowing that. Okay, Councillor Vickers. So, if if I may ask for you know further clarification, so if if we pass this with my amendment of phasing it, uh, phasing the uh, percentage in, and we give a one percent increase on the cola, our wages will increase by ninety one thousand five hundred sixty one dollars plus the one percent, if that's what the desire is of council. That's Would included. that be a fair assessment? That one percent is included in that. Uh, I, it's a little while ago since I produced this number, but I, I believe that this number includes the one percent already because council's already given us that direction. Okay. So, so to get up just, to the, it's nine one thousand in addition to that. Now that is a higher number than it was in twenty twenty one because council's approved additional staff since then. Uh, but that the one percent cover is already included. In it's, it's in there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, that's not the way I read it. Yeah. <clears throat> it says and. It says you approve the 50th percentile target and an annual economic adjustment. Uh, so I think this is a, a semantics question. Um, and, and maybe we're missing a comma. It says approve the proposed 2020 salary framework. Stop. Which includes the job rates reflecting the 50th percentile and a 1% increase. Great. It doesn't say that. But uh, let's put, let's, I think if, let's, if there's a comma in there, it probably would. But that's, I was just <laughs> going to suggest let's put a comma right after framework, comma, with job rates reflecting the 50th percentile uh, pay target and the one, the annual one, one percent. So I read that as being included in there. So if I may, Madam Mayor, the the staff report has the proposed grid that includes the one percent, so you can actually see the job yeah. rates yeah. with those salaries yeah. in there and compare it to the current 2021. Didn't know it was in there. Yeah. So we we uh, are still with the um, yes. motion to amend, which is to phase in the uh, phased in approach, which would bring the increase to the 2022 operating budget down to $91,561 approximately, yeah. That is the motion that is on the floor at the moment. It's been moved and seconded. And I will call a question on that unless there's further discussion on that. Sure. Okay, Councillor Bell. Further discussion, Please. call the question. Okay, <laughs> I will call the question. All in favor of uh, this phased in approach. Two, three, four, five, and that is unanimous. Thank you very much. We'll go with that. And then let's um, go back now to the original amended motion as amended, that we will approve the proposed 2022 salary framework, comma, with job rates reflecting the 50 percentile pay target and an annual economic increase adjustment of 1% effective January 1, 2022, and adopt the practice of undertaking a, period, um, a periodic market review of all positions on a four-year cycle. All in and the, the, the salary frame will be introduced on a phased in basis. You've got, a, you've got a number three in there now. Okay, salary phased in process. All in favor of that as, as amended, this motion as amended, and that is carried as well. Thank you very much for all of that hard work and the explanations.
um, it is and it is uh, very very important and uh, I certainly agree with uh, the deputy mayor we are a service our business is service and we cannot complete the service that we have determined as the standards without uh, recognizing the value of our staff and uh, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, they are our greatest asset and we need to treat them as such so thank you very much for all of that now we can move out of a uh, motion a uh, motion to move out of the committee of the whole please deputy mayor thank you and councillor greenfield um at uh, 406 um are there any notices of motion coming forward deputy mayor uh thank you your worship and further to the uh Presentation from uh, Simona Fribergova. Um, I would like to make a notice of motion um, to uh, look at a new location for a community garden. Okay. Thank you. Um, we did have a motion for decision, but I believe that has been withdrawn. All right. So that takes us then to the adoption of minutes. Closed meeting for November the 8th. Uh, 2021. Have a mover and a seconder, please. Um, so I won't need to declare on that the public meeting. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Put that on Councillor uh, Greenfield and Councillor Bartley. All in favor? And that is carried. Okay. The next one is the planning public meeting on, no on November the 9th. Move it a seconder, please. Oh, that's the one I should have declared on. That's the one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Wondered why that was. All right. Um, move it a seconder, please. Councillor Bartley, Councillor Bell. All in favor? And that is carried. All right. Council meeting November 15th. Move it a seconder, please. Councillor Kentner. Councilor Vickers. And all in favor? Council meeting. And that is carried. Anything on the communications file that uh, folks would like to bring out? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. And I just thought I'd briefly make a mention of the um, Item B, the OPP mm -hmm. Grey Bruce Detachment Report. And I found it very interesting that they also speak to staffing challenges, uh, quite significant ones. But in looking through uh, the report, the top charges laid are with regards to speeding. And we so often hear from our residents concerned with, uh, with speeding. We all get emails and calls and mention of that on many, many occasions. And so I just thought it was important to recognize that the OPP seemed to be acknowledging that in, re, in, um, in their report, noting that that is the most significant charge that they hand out. And hopefully as they resolve their own staffing challenges, they'll be able to put even more emphasis on uh, catching our speeders. Again, that's uh, probably uh, more police will be an enhancement of services. Yes, I Thank you, Your Worship. I'd just like to go on record too that that was the best report I've seen from the OPP to date. Uh, if we were getting that kind of information on a routine basis, I'd have a lot more confidence in the value of, uh, of the OPP service. And I thought it was uh, a, quite a, a jump in, in standard of the report. Many, many graphs which were easy to understand and uh, a lot of detail on, on the various occurrences. And you have a lot clearer picture of what's going on and what's going wrong uh, as far as crime is concerned. Through you, Madam Mayor, uh, I should perhaps uh, just in response to that really recognize that the acting detachment commander, Deborah Anderson, when she first came in, uh, took over that role last year, one of her first things that she said to me was, the reports are awful, we need to fix them. And I think we've seen an iterative change every time. So, so I, I agree, this is fantastic compared to what we used to get. And I think we will see that continue. I agree. It certainly was very, very easy to follow. From my perspective, it reiterated to me that of the uh, comparative to uh, the Gray County 
stats, which uh, were also included in that, we are a very, continue to be a very, very safe community. And that's very, very welcoming news. So um, anything else then, Councillor Vickers? Thank you, Your Worship. And I'd like to bring forward the, the letter from uh, the Township of Chatsworth. Uh, and if I'm reading it right, is to basically give support uh, to Craig Gables. And I know the County Council has decided they can't uh, uh, fund all the projects all at once, but I do think it's important that uh, the municipalities do still support that the, uh, the long-term vision and plan of 128 beds uh, for Greg Gables is important. And I'd like to, uh, you know, you bring it forward as, uh, because obviously it's support of their letter, but I think we need to stamp the municipality of Meaford on that instead of uh, just supporting Chatsworth's letter. So you, Madam Mayor, what Councillor Vickers could do, uh, if he wants to, is basically deal with the last four <coughs> clauses of that motion and just replace Township of Chatsworth with Municipality of Meaford. So we'd have a motion that says, whereas Grey Gables is a 66-bed Class A facility by the Ministry of Long-Term Care, and whereas the County of Grey applied for and received free development for Grey Gables for an additional 62-bed allocation is considering a new building of 128-bed facility. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Municipality of Meaford fully supports the 128-bed redevelopment of Grey Gables and for the Council Direct Staff to circulate a resolution to all municipalities in Grey County, if you wish it. I do wish. Thanks, Matt. I second it. Uh, Deputy second. Mayor, I was recognizing Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, just to jump in, if my recollection is correct, I believe this letter originally came from Grey Highlands and we discussed it and decided at that point in time that we would allow the support to continue through, uh, through the Grey County process. And if, again, if I'm reading this correctly, I think this is the Township of Chatsworth supporting that original motion from uh, Grey Highlands. Would that be right, Your Worship? Well, that's my, rec my recollection of it as well. Um, but it also, I think, brings uh, to the forefront the rationale for putting pause on that redevelopment project, 128 bed at the cost of, of my recollection is correct, 46.5 million, was it, or 48.5 million dollars? Say 4.7, but in that. It was in that range, 46 to 48 million dollars that would have to be debt financed by Gray County to move forward with this project. And that would tie the hands of six future councils of Gray County, 24 years of debt, um, maximum debt capacity used to move this project forward. That's why it was put on pause. And um, for that reason, I think that uh, this is not something that um, the moving the project forward to the redevelopment, the rebuild, because that is what uh, has been offered by the province is a rebuild of Gray Gables. That was not what was wanted by the residents of, in, um, in the area that proposed or that uh, supported wanted Gray Gables to continue in under the care and uh, management um, by the county. Um, all they wanted was Gray Gables to be there in, the, in its present form, the 66 beds that were there. So it has jumped from that to an increase of beds. Um, and the province has said, you cannot expand the current facility you have. You have to build new, which puts the price tag significantly higher than what it would be to maintain the 66 beds that are there and to, um, uh, as opposed to creating a whole new build for Gray Gables for 128 beds. And that's why, I can't support this going forward for that reason, because um, I can't commit to um, using up the whole of the debt capacity that Gray County will have for the next 24 years to do a, a new build um, at this late stage. So from that perspective, I just wanted everyone to be aware of that um, going so forward. I can fully appreciate your comments, uh, your worship. and. If, uh, if that is the, the issue of, uh, of the money to uh, needed to, to rebuild, 
will Gray County let go of those beds and let a private uh, company come in and, and do it? Like this, this is like, what the issue that is. Be, that may be. But th this isn't what people want though, either. Like we, we've gone through, and I don't know whether this is proper debate or not, but we've gone through a time of COVID where it seemed like the private uh, care facilities had a much worse uh, mortality rate, a death rate on uh, on the citizens and the people that live there, Definitely. and people and people are saying that we need to uh, you know get it back into uh, uh, a government owned sort of a thing instead of having uh, individuals uh, uh, individuals profiting prop, profiting uh, on the backs of uh, of the nursing homes. So um, you know, I, I just don't want this to be all of a sudden dead and and the way i remember the the letter from gray highlands that came forward and it didn't seem nearly as straightforward as this one so uh you know i apologize for uh you know maybe missing it the last time but i there was something about the wording that gray highlands had uh, had had made in their letter i didn't quite like the wording and this seems very much uh, clearer to me that uh we as a municipality still want to see uh 128 beds uh, long-term care unit close to our municipality. We have 128 beds coming in our municipality with our, with our and facility. If I, if I can say, yeah. will the county let go of those, the, the, those beds, if, if they aren't going to fulfill them, if it's going to, you know, be burdensome on the county, then they should just let it go and let it go into private hands. Cause chances are private hands will take, take a hold of this project and, and move it along. Mm-hmm. It's a possibility, and that certainly was an option. I'm not sure that we uh, that uh, this is a <laughs> the time of the place for for this kind of a, a discussion going forward. Councillor Kentner, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I think that it is appropriate. Uh, for one thing, you know, we, we're trying to get along better with our neighbor in Chatsworth, and uh, Chatsworth is is making this a, a an important. Uh, a resolution from their standpoint, and I think you know it's good for us to decide: Are we going to support them, uh, in as much as we're knocking on their door quite frequently for for close cooperation? Um, the the thing that has me confused is that um, <clears throat> there was great enthusiasm within the county for the 128 bed project in in Markdale uh, until they saw the price tag, and I believe the the price tag. Um, you know, it didn't start out uh, where where it ended up, and I, I I'm just confused as to why it jumped. It, it bears no relationship to the cost of the 128 bed facility being built in Durham, and uh, all of a sudden, like in, over the space of uh, of a, a matter of months, the cost skyrocketed. And I believe that uh, there's a lot of people in in uh, Gray Highlands believe that uh, this this can be um, brought about without that price tag, uh, and it, I, I so I understood that it was being uh, put on the back burner, not not shelved completely, right. and uh, it's paused. Paused, yeah. So, yes. I, so there's further discussion to be had on this issue before it's uh, it, it's finished. Um, Councillor Bartley and Councillor Greenfield. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I, I never did get an answer why it skyrocketed. And I'd like to see what it costs per bed on the one that's being built down the street here. But having said that, I, I, I would support what Councillor Vickers is doing and just add one codicil to the end, when feasible to do so. No, we support it when feasible to do so. Because I think somebody was holding them ransom on the price tag. That's my only personal thoughts. Thank you. Well, with all due respect, that question was brought up at, at Gray County, and the answer came back that no, they're not. This is what it cost. It, it, there was it, it, there was a, uh, intense scrutiny over that the differential in cost, and the cost of, as I re uh, recollect, the cost of uh, Rockford was uh, forty-two million, roughly, roughly, in that area. So it's uh, the differences four to six million dollars in the two. But the, the point too is that both of them going at the same time just wipes out the capacity. Not only that, but then it, it also increases the levy that comes down to each of the municipalities to support as, as it goes along. Councillor Greenfield. 
Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Mayor Compass, and uh, yeah, I think you're right. We may be getting a little out of our realm, um, but uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, the kerfuffle about Gray Gables originally three or four years ago was uh, due to the fact that we're going to get a new Rockwood Terrace in uh, in, in Durham. Uh, and the question at that time was, well, do we, with Rockwood Terrace and Lee Manor under the uh, county flag, uh, do we really need Gray Gables or should be, it be put on the market? Now, eventually it, it was saved. Um, I, 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 if you're looking at a four or five bedroom hospital costing 30 some million, I can certainly see this <laughs> long-term care running much higher than that. I, I, I guess what I've been wondering is, is there still confidence at Gray County Council with uh, having that 62 beds at, at Gray G Gables? Like is, uh, I, I'm hoping that will continue, but, uh, I know that's historically been an odd number for staffing and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is Gray County Council still supporting Gray Gables continuing in the future as is, or uh, is that still I, up for grabs? I think, and please uh, uh, jump in here, uh, Deputy Mayor, from my perspective, and I'd sit on the Long-Term Care uh, Committee of Management um, yes, definitely the, the commitment is there for the 66 current beds at Gray Gables. There's um, a very different, um, what they call acuity level um, with a long-term care facility and increasing uh, the Gray Gables site, a new build for 128 beds puts it into a very different category of acuity and care that is required. Um, the 66 beds as it is now um, in, in for memory care and for uh, for um, support of residents with uh, less um, challenges, perhaps than the, than the full 128 bed um, uh, long term care facility is is part of the issue that has to be discussed going forward. So the, the answer to your question is in terms of the 66 beds that are current at, at Ray Gables. Yes, there is solid commitment. To continue that on, it's a question of uh, because it can't um, it, it it can't it has to be a new build for those 128 beds. Um, that is what the province will approve, uh, but it will not approve um, an extension of the 66 beds. So that can the care that for memory care and that type of care for residents can continue on at Gray Gables. And, and is solidly supported by Gray County. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, thank you for your uh, forbearance. Um, so uh, could you just answer or clarify for me? Uh, I thought that uh, Gray Gables would not you know, qualify beyond 2025 as a long-term care, is it? Um, no. No, it's it, it's fine. It is a it is a class A facility for the, the type of care that is that is given. Thank you, De Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. And and on that note, I think I know we don't know yet, but I think many of us are hopeful that the province will extend that 2025 deadline given the challenges of, of COVID. But I just wanted to state that I certainly am in favor of Greg Abel's going forward, but it is a matter of the funding. And there's also, I think, a hope at the county level, a hope anyway, that some other funding sources can be found to help this project go forward. And that's part of the reason for the pause is, is to see what can happen in that regard. But another important point is to recognize that it's not just the building of the homes, there's an operating cost within the county budget, and we have not seen the budget yet for 2022, but my guess is for the 128 beds at Lee Manor, and we'll say 128 at Rockwood, and the existing beds at Gray Gables that were somewhere in the area of $8 million within the Gray County budget for operating costs because those homes are not self-sufficient. There is a cost to the county uh, rate payer to operate those homes so that, uh, that is additional to the cost of building the homes. No kidding. In addition to that, it uh, the, the current uh, cost that we are aware of in terms of uh, 
uh, costs, um, there is a deficit in uh, funding, operating funding for the long-term care homes this year, a significant uh, deficit. So I'd like to make an amendment or to add in uh, the one last line that uh, Councillor Bartley uh, talked about when financially uh, possible is what is that feasible. What, feasible. So I don't know if that's acceptable to the uh, to the secondary or not, but uh, I would certainly put that in as uh, as part of my motion. I forgot who was the secondary. Uh, I think Shirley did. Yeah, I think it was Shirley. I'm not. Too it, sure. it was. Yeah. I don't think it was, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Just trying to keep it easy. Uh, so there's an amendment. Um, to the to the motion okay you're going to amend your own motion so a, a friendly amendment i guess is what they call amendment. it i think yeah 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 okay um is there any further discussion on this and then i will call the question all in favor of this motion and those against and that is carried okay um That is it for the, and now we need a, a motion to, for the confirming bylaw. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-90 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Meaford as regular and special meetings held in the month of November, 2021. Be taken as read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Bartley, Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor, thank you. All in favor? And that is carried. And that completes our agenda as presented. I want to thank everyone for your contribution, good discussion, and to staff for your uh, the work that you have completed um, to bring us this agenda today. And I declare this meeting now adjourned. Thank you.